This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning across the nation. Good morning worldwide. An exceptional weekend. Ed Yardeni with the smartest short note, short note of the weekend, yep. alluding to the winds of war in the markets, Paul. Stable this morning off the winds of war of the weekend. Yes, yeah, probably is. Uh, probably about as, as mute as it could have been over the weekend in terms of the responses and what's happening over there in that part of the world. Uh, S&P up about four tenths of one percent here. The Nasdaq up about a half of one percent, Tom. So a little bit of lift here to the market as we get really dive into the meat of earnings here. Everyone watching oil and Rita Sen scheduled to be with us later among other experts. $89.81 down from the 90 level on Brent crude. West Texas 84.97. Lisa will do all that here uh, in a moment. I didn't work all weekend. I had to stop by Watch 10 minutes of the Masters. Yep. You know, watch some Red Sox baseball. Marathon day. Good morning, Boston. Oh, that's right. Yes, that's Derek right. Lowe will be with us in the 9 o'clock hour. I had a tantrum. I said, get somebody with a motion. <laughs> and they got Derek Lowe to get us that's into the, that's a good the baseball season. But a special day up in Boston. Yep. Good morning there on Bloomberg Radio. And what, what I would say is the team worked all weekend. Coming up, James Stravitas, formerly with the United States Navy. Did, 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 Navy, did Navy have a good weekend? Yeah. I think Navy had a good weekend. Yes, they did. So it's, it's interesting. So we'll have you know, a lot of geopolitics uh, right back on the front burner there, Tom. But again, the markets seem to be taking it yeah. all in a stride here. Uh, yields a little bit higher here. Tenure Treasury up a little bit here, 4.56%. Goldman Sachs in 27 uh, minutes. Of course, we're on Apple CarPlay and on Android. Uh, out of Google Play, somebody came up at a restaurant. Why don't you ever mention Google, uh, Android? Yeah, Android like Radio. four people use it in New York. Yeah, but yeah. Android Radio, you can do it. Download the Bloomberg Business app, Apple CarPlay uh, as well, in 20 uh, nations around the world. YouTube, I haven't even logged on to live chat yet. I'll get on the live chat here uh, in a moment. YouTube, you search Bloomberg Podcasts, Bloomberg Podcasts, yep. and that gets you to cut and chisel handsome Paul Sweeney. Also, we're from the Interactive Broker Studios, and you know that because of her tweet of the weekend. I'm sorry, Lisa Mateo, massive tweet from mile 42 at Costco. Oh, yes. Uh, full full cart. Full cart. Yep. Full cart. Full cart. With our, with our five hundred dollars later. <laughs> <laughs> and it would have been seven hundred at whole paycheck. Yeah. With our Bloomberg Business Flash, an important market report. Lisa Mateo. You got it. Yeah. Futures showing some signs of stability. Traders kind of weighing whether or not tensions in the Middle East will escalate after Iran's attack on Israel over, over the weekend. Right now we have Nasdaq futures up about half a percent. S and P futures up about four tenths of a percent. Dow futures up about two tenths of a percent. The two-year yield at four point nine four percent. That's up about four basis points. The year and the 10 yield at 4.57%, and that's up about four basis points. To commodities, have to talk oil easing on that speculation that Middle East conflict will remain contained. Right now, we have Brent crude at $89 a barrel, NYMEX crude at $84 a barrel. As we point to gold, spot gold higher at 2,357 an ounce. Companies making news will start with Apple. The company faces its worst iPhone slump since the COVID lockdowns. We have its China rivals starting to rise. That's according to market tracker IDC. And then we have Tesla down nearly a percent. Elon Musk told workers in a memo the company is going to reduce its global headcount by more than 10 percent. That's to reduce costs. And then you have Amazon up about half a percent. They actually installed more than 17,000 chargers at about 120 of their warehouses around the U.S. That's making it the largest operator of private EV charging infrastructure in the country. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. We're going to get to the war in a moment. Elliot Ackerman to be along in about 15 minutes. Right now on market, Sarah Hunt joins us this morning. I was looking at the operating income of the banks with Goldman Sachs coming out. And just, they just, their profit growth is there, but it's not tech-like. Are they profitable and are they a growing profitable entity, the big banks, or are they not? 
Well, the big banks are just getting bigger, right? So to the extent that the regional banks are suffering because the bigger banks are getting bigger, there is growth there. Is it tech-like growth? No. But if you see, if you start to see some other areas pick up, like capital markets, which has essentially been more abound for the next for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. they're they're pointing to some opening in some of those areas. I think the bigger banks continue to get bigger, and I think in that sense there's growth. But no, it's not going to be a hockey yeah. stick like some of the tech yeah. stocks. So, sir, I mean, we're getting into the meat of earnings here this week here. What are you looking for for this earnings cycle um, from some of the leading players? It's a combination of what the first quarter looked like and what their expectations are for the rest of the year. Because I think that given where the valuations are in the equity markets and all the geopolitical tensions that we're talking about, you're at some fairly lofty valuation levels. So you need to see some real earnings come through here. And to the extent that people are already expecting earnings to be better, they need to not just be better, but the going forward has to look pretty good as well. So, I mean, it's interesting. You talk about valuation and we've had this big, big move for equity prices off those October lows up 25% plus for the S&P 500. I don't think we've seen necessarily that type of earnings expansion as well. So where are we in, in terms of valuation here? We're on the higher end, right? So to the extent that some of the technology stocks have got the hockey stick growth that is supporting multiples because people are expecting the earnings to grow into those multiples. So the multiples will come down because the earnings are coming up. But I think if you look at the market as a whole, we're on that higher end on the multiple side. And that's it's been a real multiple expansion more than an earnings catch up. And if the earnings don't end, actually end up coming through, I think you have some vulnerability there. So what do you do if you're in the game? You know, there's a lot. I, I often talk about people that have missed this bull market. Let's say I'm in it. And there's like stage two, stage three, the whatever. How do you treat cash right now? I mean, if you're trying to be an adult and you're running at 5% cash or 8% cash, do you want to build that or do you want to put money to work right now? It's a combination of things. I think there's nothing wrong with having a, something like a 5% cash position, somewhere in between that. The, the higher up you go, the more you become at risk of not just of not really managing money if you're supposed to be an equity manager, right? You want to be looking at what's going on. I think the market has broadened out. I think that there's some opportunities in some of the spaces. I mean, I talked about energy for ages, but certainly what's going on right yeah. now, you've yeah. got some longer term, better prospects for the energy group, which is unfortunate because of the geopolitical situation, but that combined with the energy transition story <coughs> means that you're you're seeing some right. higher oil prices. Three month T bill, 5.38%. One year T bill, shockingly lower, 5.15%. Tom, I mean, you're. It's like 90 day money. You're all set there in your uh, triple all leverage cash <coughs> fund here. So, well, what do you we... want to go through it? I, I, I learned this weekend we just did the end of quarter review. I yeah. got a 2 and 20 payout. Nice. It's great. You okay, know, we, very grossed good. Out, we grossed at 13.5%. Nice. There's some fees involved. There's some fees. You know, yeah, got, gotta everybody's got to get paid. Everybody's got to get and, paid. you know, net clean, we got 2 and 20. Sarah, so what do we do here? I mean, again, technology's been the leader in this market since I can't remember when. And is that still the case here? Does technology need to drive this market this forward. This is the question of the week, folks. Sweeney just asked it. This, I, is, this is everything. I think the answer is yes. I mean, if you yep. just look at where the growth is, it's on technology. So do you need other things to, to do well as well? Yes, you do. But if you really saw a problem with technology, that's going to be a problem for the entire market. I think it does need to keep that leadership. So are you, are you a buyer in this whole AI stuff? Tom and I are, are still trying to figure out what AI means. But Sweeney, everybody's Sweeney, telling Sweeney us went down to Duke this weekend. To oh, got smart. AI got smart. Was. Well, you look at all the areas that are going to be impacted by it. There's a huge spend going on right now because of it. And the question is, how is that going to make us profitable? Because the real issue with AI is, can I get my margins up by using it in some way? And the questions are sort of like, AI, question mark, I'm going to make more money. Mm -hmm. That question mark is coming through for some of the players, yeah. like Microsoft and some of the cloud well, players. It's going to be a question going forward how you actually monetize that. I typed all that. in Microsoft as you were going. I got 30 seconds. Microsoft, pre COVID, 52 billion, excuse me, 38 billion, 38 billion free cash flow. Oh, it's almost a double. The, the arch question to yep. Paul's great question, can this juggernaut be sustained? You're saying yes. Well, I'm saying that they need to continue to show growth. And that if they show growth, then the juggernaut will be sustained. If the growth slows down, that's going to be a big question mark how the rest of the market oh, reacts as well. Absolutely. Sarah, thanks for getting us started this week. Sarah uh, Hunt with us. Greatly, greatly uh, uh, appreciate that with Alpine Woods. Uh, capital investors. Paul, I think this is the heart of the matter. Nobody wants to talk about it because they were like, boring. But the answer is they got us here. Yep. There's four, 483 stocks at, 
you know, they broadened out. Sarah Hunt, Gina Martin Adams, I thought was yep. great last yep. week. But the answer is, it's still about twenty stocks, fifteen stocks, whatever. Can yeah, it, keep I mean, going? It's, and you think about it. You think about the top-down story about global technology, artificial intelligence, and everything else. Um, that is where the spending is going. That is where the growth is. And I can't see a market working without right. global tech leading us. The uh, again, if you're with us, the markets are solid. That's what to know off of all that we see in geopolitics. Futures up 23. That's off a very difficult Friday. The VIX is probably as good a measure as any. Remember 12, 13, Nirvana, out to yep. 16, out to 17. We're in a little bit. 17.08 early in the morning or 20 minutes before Goldman Sachs. Dollar strength, we had a 106 on DXY, now at 105.86 uh, uh, right now. And first thing I looked at this morning was just to see Rin Minbi and see how the Chinese played this. And they go unch, you know, in their heavily yep. managed yuan, 7.2386. Uh, With our news in New York City is John Tucker. All right, Tanjana and Lisa, global diplomatic effort underway to try to avoid a full-blown regional war in the Middle East. Iran fired more than 300 drones and missiles against Israel over the weekend, almost all intercepted before they reached Israeli airspace. Let's get more from Bloomberg Israel Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner in Tel Aviv. The fact that there were not, there was not any death here. There was a seven-year-old girl who's fighting for her life uh, who was hit by shrapnel. But other than that, no casualties and no genuine damage uh, to its uh, military uh, facilities that were attacked. Uh, that has given uh, Israel a sense of accomplishment and relief and not a need for instantly responding. Uh, and then those other factors are playing a role, which is there's some fatigue uh, and there's some desire to not alienate the United States. House Speaker Mike Johnson promising a vote on aid to Israel this week, and he's indicating funds for Ukraine could be part of that package. The House Foreign Affairs Chair Michael McCall tells CBS's Face of the Nation Ukraine needs to be included. What I need to educate my colleagues is they're all tied together. I mean, Iran is selling this stuff to Russia. Guess who's buying Iran's energy? China. And you know why? Because we, we lifted or waived the sanctions that we had, this administration, on the drones and, and the missiles and on the energy. Well, you can hear Face the Nation, Meet the Press, and this week, every Sunday on Bloomberg Radio. Let's turn now to the criminal case involving Donald Trump. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines covering the trial in Manhattan for us. Donald Trump's historic New York criminal trial begins today, the first ever for a former U.S. president. He's charged by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, allegedly concealing hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Trump will be legally required to attend as a criminal defendant despite his ongoing presidential campaign. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. The proceedings today begin with jury selection, which could last up to two weeks. The trial in total could last up to eight. In New York, Kaylee Lines, Bloomberg. Radio. And 11 people standing outside a family gathering Saturday night were in what Chicago police believe was a gang related to violence on the city's south side. Four victims were children. An eight year old girl was fatally shot. A one year old boy and an eight year old were each shot multiple times and listed in critical condition. Global News 24 hours a day, whenever you want it, with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker, and this is is Bloomberg, Tom, Paul, Lisa. Well, John Tucker, thanks so much. Again, in the currency space, watching it carefully, 105.84 on DXY, churning a slightly weaker dollar. Yen has my full attention. I have a 154 yen, euro yen, 164 uh, as well. So maybe that's something to watch here into the morning. Brent crude, number one statistic on the screen, 89.81. Out on YouTube, we've got live chat going. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Look for Lisa Mateo. Bloomberg YouTube. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Geopolitics definitely in the spotlight as markets weigh whether Iran's weekend strike on Israel is going to trigger a round of retaliation. But right now, futures are advancing. We have Nasdaq futures up more than half a percent, S&P futures up four tenths of a percent, Dow futures up about three tenths of a percent. The yield on the two year at 4.94 percent, that's up about three basis points. The 10 year yield at 4.57 percent, and that's up about four basis points. Today, investors, we're going to get a read on consumer spending, the latest retail sales report at 8.30 Wall Street time. We also get Empire Manufacturing. And also this week, new data on how the housing market faring with mortgage rates still high. Earnings season continues. Yes, we have Goldman Sachs in just a few moments, as well as Charles Schwab, M&T Bank also reporting. Ahead of that, we'll check in with it. Goldman right now up two tenths of a percent. We have Charles Schwab down three tenths of a percent. M&T Bank down a half a percent. Companies making news want to point out Samsung. Word that the Biden administration plans to award the company as much as $6.4 billion in grants to increase chip production in Texas. And Salesforce. Bloomberg has learned the company targeting Informatica. That move would add onto its data integration. Shares are down about 2%. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Paul, one of the great nexus in the world is a Saturday morning on Madison Avenue. You know, it's up with the shishi. Sure, roof, I know. You, know, yeah. you know, I'm hanging around. And yep, of course. Being cool. You know, you go into K&D Wines and you look for really? a, a different vermouth. Okay. You know, something like that. And you go down the block and, and there's the corner bookstore. And it's iconic. You've seen it in movies, folks. Yeah. The corner bookstore, Madison Avenue, up in the fancy part. And there in the left window, centered, I said to Mrs. Keene, I said, this is 2054. Yeah. This is a good book. It's going to be with my book of the summer. Now, after what we <laughs> saw this weekend, I have two books this summer, Chip Wars, Chris Miller, on technology. In 2054, the follow-up to 2034, on technology in the military, oh boy. which I think we saw this weekend. Yes, I think we did. We are going to give you, I'm so proud, I got goosebumps, folks. I got ducky bumps this morning <laughs> over the lineup you're going to see this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance as we try to understand this weekend. We start strong with the Marine, Elliot Ackerman, the author of 2054 with James Stravitas. Uh, Elliot, I'm going to cut to the chase. You have thought long and hard of the legitimacy of drone warfare. Uh, Lushenko and Romani have a classic book, The Legitimacy of Drone Warfare, Evalu Evaluating Public Perceptions. You and Stravitas take it to 2054, where it's fair play. Is it fair play this weekend, how well the Israelis did? Or does drone warfare change your military? I think drone warfare right now is, uh, is is already changing militaries around the world and it's creating a disaggregation of military power, really a type of military reset uh, we haven't seen yeah. since the onset of the Second World War. So uh, so yes, it's it's changing over the skies of Israel um, you know, and in the trenches of Ukraine. So I think everyone should be paying attention. So Elliot, the, the bottom line is here, over the weekend we had obviously a pretty significant drone and missile attack. Uh, on Israel. It seems like the Israel, Israeli defense kind of dealt with it pretty well. What do you think next steps will be or what do you think next steps should be from Israel? Well, you know, I think the Iranian uh, response to the uh, attack on their consulate in Syria sort of follows a pattern uh, similar to what happened when the U.S. killed uh, their General Qasem Soleimani is, you know, there is a, a massive, though ineffective response on the part of the Iranians that allows them to claim uh, that they have responded in kind. So I, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we're going to see sort of, you know, yes, an Israeli counter, right. um, but the escalation. But I think what's also what's more profound though is that this is really the first time the Iranians have sort of right. stepped out from behind their proxies and directly struck Israel. Elliot, I mean, and to go to your expertise and your thinking in 2054 on drone warfare, we have navy assets in the Eastern Mediterranean. I remember being humbled on a morning when we had death of the United Kingdom off Argentina with an Exocet missile. Can those drones attack our ships? I, I mean, are they, you know, to, to borrow a phrase from another war, are they kamikaze drones that are great risk to our uh, people floating in the Mediterranean? 
you know, I don't, you know, the, the U S Navy in the Mediterranean, uh, has pretty significant countermeasures to, uh, any type of drone that Iran would fire, but the, the quality of these drones and the technology on them is only increasing and you need look no further than the black sea in which almost two thirds of Russian ships have been damaged. And they've been damaged or even sunk in many cases by a nation that has no right. significant navy, which is Ukraine. Paul, I think this is a huge deal. And he goes yeah. right to the heart of it. We got two wars that we're experimenting with this new technology. Exactly right. So, uh, Elliot, I mean, it, it's interesting here. It seems like here in the Middle East, much like, much like in Ukraine, it, it, we've kind of gotten to a little bit of a stalemate here. How do you think in the Middle East? this plays out over the next several weeks or months. How do you think the things will develop? Yeah, I think the most the most profound development from, from this weekend, again, is this point that the Iranians are no longer uh, hiding behind their proxies. So for a long time, we've all been playing a game in which the Iranians set the rules. Uh, they would they would attack Israel or attack our allies. We would not respond against the Iranians because it was their proxies doing it. So now they've basically undone the rules of this game. And I think we're going to have right. to see a strategic realignment on the part of the West and our allies in terms of how we deal with Iran. And that's going right. to play out in weeks and months ahead. If, if I assume that the Iron Dome only goes out, I'm going to say it as an amateur, 200 miles Let's assume Britain and the United States helped out with the farther away missiles. What would have happened to Israel if the United States Navy had not been there, Mr. Ackerman? I think it starts to become very, very challenging um, for the Israelis. And the Israelis have always known that you know their their security uh, is reliant upon uh, the the network of allies uh, that exists. But uh, I think, for instance, what we've seen with the Jordanian response and the response from the Arab world is is pretty robust. Um, you know, people are right. if they're not awake now, they're becoming much more awake to what a menace Iran is to the region. I have two books of the summer: Chip War with Chris Miller and 2054. Elliot Ackerman and James Trevitas, they all center around this new technology, which we're adjusting to as we did this weekend. Elliot Ackerman, thank you so much for your time this morning, the author of 2054. Uh, David is over at Goldman Sachs. Mr. Solomon's gonna have to author an earnings discussion and a view forward as well. This is trenchant, I mean, the news here is he can't keep people underneath them. They keep, you know, is a generalization. Yeah. They keep drifting away. Yep. Some of the ratios are actually pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Which Goldman Sachs are we going to see know. in it's six gonna be, minutes? It's going to be interesting, Tom. we got Goldman Sachs. Uh, GS is the ticker symbol. Market cap, $130 billion. Stock is absolutely unchanged on the year to date, Tom. It's up about 20% over the past 12 months here. But, you know, just that stock price, no movement this year. People are really trying to get a sense of, kind of what the next six to 12 to 18 months mean for Goldman Sachs. Yeah. I'm looking at the, the ANR function, 18 buys and 10 holds on this stock. Yeah, so 10 holds split speaks, on this all. And let's remember folks, we, we bundle all these banks in together, which drives me nuts. I got 310,000 bodies at JP Morgan. I got one ninth at 34,000 bodies at yep. Goldman Sachs. It's one tenth, one ninth the size of J.P. Morgan, so they're really not comparable, but we'll do that. Allison Williams uh, scheduled uh, to be with us. Also fired up. Did you see the newspapers? Yeah. They give I us know. a look. We're not allowed yep. to talk to Lisa about it. They keep us separated yeah. uh, on the floor, but Chinese we got we got to look there. And, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's it's, it's a it's germane newspapers yep. here on a 80 degree day. Does it get to 80 today in New York? Could be. Boy, how good would that be? I'm still dressed for the frigid March we've had. I mean, you know, it's like gorgeous here, folks. We'll have to say good morning, Boston. It is marathon day. If you Big are day. from Boston, it is religion. There's yep. no other way uh, to put it. Just great. Derek Lowe, scheduled to be with us wow. on um, uh, lots in modern baseball as well. On the data front, as Ed Yardeni said over the weekend, it is the winds of war, and the markets have reacted well this morning. SPX up half a percent, NASDAQ up six tenths of a percent, Brent crude stable to say the least, $89.86. Our Ethan Bronner, our team in Tel Aviv, on the watch. Please stay with us on Apple CarPlay, on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. The, the live chat is on fire this morning. <laughs> Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Good morning, everyone. We have breaking news here. We welcome all of you across the nation and particularly global Wall Street, always interested in Goldman Sachs. It is a moonshot. The stock is up 3-4% from a 389 level, just now printing 400 up to 402. Pa, I've never seen this. It is 30 discrete Bloomberg News headlines of a firm firing on near all cylinders. Yeah, I'm just looking at some of the headlines. I'm looking at the top live uh, for Bloomberg. Uh, global banking and markets revenue really beat across the board, Tom. Well, it did, and you know, you're seeing it uh, statistic to statistic. I mean, just as simple as what FIC is doing and uh, advisory revenue. To give you an idea, $874 million was the estimate, and they come in almost $200 million above that, $1.01 billion. Just as one example, their efficiency ratio is pretty good, 60.9%. Uh, some of the other headlines coming out right now, but there's no question that this is the, by far and away the best thing I've seen for David Solomon in ages. She has perspective on this, the compare and contrast of our major banks. Allison Williams with Bloomberg Intelligence. Allison, I've never seen this. It's not only a beat and firing on all cylinders, but it's the quality of the beat. Am I right on that? It is. I mean, wow, those trading numbers, 10% yeah. growth in both FIC and equities, obviously better than expected, outperforming the peers. You know, the other thing we always look at when they have a big surprise is the equity investment income, yeah. which is sort of the money that they, they get from investments. And that was actually 200 and uh, only a couple hundred million versus 400 million, which, as you said, really shows to the quality of this beat. Right. And again, the credit losses for those worried about the banking in Utah and all that estimate was half a billion and they come in way under that 318 billion. Paul, I, you know, yep. there's, there's a Tom Keen wow, and that's like sort of bow tie <laughs> media. That's an Allison Williams yep. wow I just heard. Exactly, Allison Williams has, has followed this stock for, for a long time here, really seen all the cycles. Uh, Allison, how important is this earnings for Mr. David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs? I think it's important because we're, we're finally, I think, getting to some clean numbers and the fact that those clean numbers are delivering. I mean, it really, I think, supports the decision to just go back to the core <clears throat> focus of this company. Yep. Last year, we saw a lot of uh, cleanup. Um, we really think uh, doing the right thing, even though some of it was reversing course very quickly after some acquisitions. But I think it's better to just, you know, make the decision um, to do the right thing and just get it behind you. And that is what they're doing. So really uh, good numbers on the trading side, the advisory side. That was a disappointment at the banks that we saw on Friday. Goldman's the biggest leader in that business. And that also coming in better than expected today. And Allison, I'm just kind of looking through the earnings statement here. Both on the fixed income and on the equity side, Goldman Sachs, from a trading sales and trading perspective, really beat forecasts. What do you think is happening there? Are they taking share from the competitors? They are taking share. The other thing I guess I would highlight is Goldman's uh, customer base is a little bit different um, than some of the biggest banks. Uh, so obviously they all target uh, the swath, a broad array of customers, but Goldman is, is really superior when it comes to the asset managers and the hedge fund managers. They've been broadening out that effort. They've also been focusing on, you know, becoming the top three with a top tier bunch of clients. And then recently, uh, you know, back in the fall, they said, look, now we're going to go and try to be number one with more clients. And so I think that this, the results show that this strategy is working. And Allison, just, just to me, it doesn't seem like the deal activity out there in the street is great, whether it's M&A or equity or debt capital markets. How, is, how are the capital markets out there these days? So the debt issuance was actually really strong to start the year. I mean, it probably doesn't feel like it to you because I think you're looking at things like IPOs and yep. deals. And so the debt issuance calendar was really strong. The one okay. uh, word of caution that we have is that, um, you know, with such strong issuance in the first quarter, many bank, many companies might have pulled that forward. So we're not sure that that necessarily translates to optimis, optimism on the outlook. And that's, yeah. you know, what we're focused on. <clears throat> However, you know, the equity underwriting side, IPOs, the volume was up. The number of deals, I think, was disappointing. But the overall equity under 
underwriting um, volumes did well. So a lot of secondaries and such yeah. um, coming forward. And so there's some good fees there, though not the, the pipelines. And we have heard that uh, things are looking a little bit more encouraging on the IPO, IPO front because we've gotten some yeah. better performance from some recent deals. Uh, and M and A just takes yeah. a while for that to manifest. See, Allison, you're worse than David Solomon. You'll do you'll do anything but talk about. I love this, folks. Platform solutions. It's oh, like boy. Doc Martens. Platform solutions, which is by many cases the bad bank here. And the answer is there's pretty good news here that they lost less money, maybe Allison, than expected. What's the timeline to get rid of platform solutions? So I think they've redefined that a little bit. And so I, one thing I would point to is there's a lot of focus on some of the consumer products that have not been successful and they've shut down. But one area that has been successful is the transaction banking business. And that is really a natural fit. What that refers to is really working with corporations, helping them to um, manage yeah. their cash. It's a little bit collecting deposits. These are... Yeah, some I mean, of the businesses that yeah. the other big banks have done well, why not right. Goldman? And I think what they've said is, look, we maybe we won't be number one, but if we can get some share, and they right. have done well there. I mean, basically pick out the toaster for the Christmas Club account. Paul, <laughs> line item here from Bloomberg. Platform solutions pre-tax loss estimate was a quarter of a billion, $260 million, and it was only 117. Right, so, so even there, uh, yep. Solomon's got something to say, wow, I am a change agent. Exactly. So, uh, Allison, what's next for Goldman Sachs? I mean, I, I, if I were a shareholder, I'd be very happy saying, just maximize your platform. Nobody's better than you guys. Just maximize your return on equity. Don't go into any new businesses. Don't do anything crazy. What's next for them? And I think that that is what's next for them, because basically, you know, under under Blank Fine, they started expanding into a lot of different businesses. And I'd also point to that was at a time, um, you know, when there was a lot of regulatory pressure, there was a lot of pressure on their core business. So they started uh, looking in all these different areas. But now they really focus pulled back and as you said they are focused on their business so right. if all the businesses that we just discussed in terms of trading right. in terms of deals the transaction banking is the right. one newer initiative that they're keeping um but asset management too alternatives right. private credit yep. we can't hear enough about yep. that right so um they're really leveraging okay. their expertise let's, in those businesses let's get out front on morgan stanley with new management there as well right. you mentioned asset management the heart of what james gorman uh, did do a compare and contrast totally unfair but i love doing this to allison do a compare and contrast on goldman sachs which we see and morgan stanley still a mystery I mean, from the big picture, you could say, you know, uh, Morgan Stanley over time through a series of deals built up their wealth management exposure. So they're more tilted towards asset and wealth management. Uh, Goldman Sachs a little bit different. As we said, they, they had some initiatives, they pulled back, but they still have the same mix, the institutional and the asset management business. So at Morgan Stanley, where the wealth management is bigger and you have that um, you know, sort of wirehouse business where you're focusing a, a little bit more um, on the mass affluent. You had a big slowing uh, last year. So first half, huge wealth inflows, really um, doing well in that business. Then we saw a big slowdown. Uh, we also had new management, as you said, uh, came out. And the one thing they did was sort of take a little bit off the top in terms of optimism with the goals and and talk about the wealth margin uh, coming in, uh, you know, sort mm -hmm. of in the below 30 percent for some right. period of time, still getting to 30 percent. So they, right. uh, they've really lowered the bar for that business. Right. But they're also we're also expecting um, to see you know, some good things on the equity side in terms of the institutional okay. side for Morgan Stanley Allison, as well. Just brilliant here on a bang up day. Goldman Sachs up a solid 3% plus, even 4% at some point. Uh, no other way to put it. Futures advance fractionally on this. Uh, NASDAQ futures up six tenths of a percent. SPX up half of a percent. Uh, right now, a Bloomberg business flash. Here's Lisa Mateo. 
And since we're talking about Goldman Sachs, I want to point out we're still waiting for Charles Schwab, M&T Bank, Charles Schwab. Their shares are little changed right now. M&T Bank, they're down about half a percent. And the markets, well, futures rebounding after closing lower Friday. We also had a weekend full of Middle East tension. Right now, NASDAQ futures up six tenths of a percent. Dow and S&P futures up about five tenths of a percent. To currencies, the yen weakened to a three-decade low against the dollar. And I want to point out Bitcoin at 66183 We have some costs cutting measures measures over at Tesla. Tesla's down about 1%, but Elon Musk told workers in a memo the company will reduce its global headcount by more than 10%. And since we're talking EVs, EV tax credit applications, they're pouring in. The Treasury has processed about $580 million in advance payment to EV dealers since the beginning of the year. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. There's a blue button. The blue button is a Detroit Lions color. Yes, exactly. Michael Barr off this week. Well deserved. Really? He, yeah, recovery. I'm not sure I approve you know, that. I mean, it's been like a six oh, week birthday celebration. Yes, he's just been going hard. Yeah, he's been, he's he only been, turned 59 once, right? Yeah, yeah you know, he's like, he's like working it uh, hard. Let's have a master's chat right now. This guy, is he really Tiger Woods? Uh, I don't, I, I won't say that, but I mean, he is the best golfer in the world, no doubt about it, and he just won his second Masters in the last three years, so he is the number one player in the world, and he showed it this week, he yeah. was, you know, start to finish, wire to wire, he was the best player out on the course, uh, and it was everybody out there, all the, the, the live golfers were there, the PGA golfers were there, everybody what was there. What does it mean for that fractious relationship forward? I don't know, I, it, you know, you just step back and you say, guys, stop talking and just do it, get everybody back together again, this is just absolutely silly, it's really hurting the game in my opinion, um, just get yeah. it together, nobody really cares anymore, just get back together and let's grow the game of golf. Yeah, we're going to have to see, we're going to have a lot more media talk as well, really a huge, Lucas Shaw's note this weekend, we have two notes I want I want to really emphasize uh, to you folks. The first is Lucas Shaw on Hollywood is an absolute tour de yep, force. Absolutely. Look for that at blo uh, Bloomberg.com. He happens with Taylor Swift. Oh, you know, that's all good. Been on the T Swift. Taylor Swift. Mark Gurman doesn't open with Taylor Swift. He's out on <laughs> Apple with power on. And all I can say is Lucas Shaw, Mark Gurman, it is hugely valued if you're part of global Wall Street. Futures up 27 with our news in New York City, John Tucker. All right, Tom, Iran's attack on Israel sparks a race to avert a full-blown war. U.S. officials and their allies focusing efforts now on ensuring any retaliation from Israel doesn't raise the stakes too high. Let's get more from Israeli Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner in Tel Aviv. The hardliners here who are demanding uh, gratification uh, for uh, to go after Iran, they will be answered by being told that, well, Israel is not going to do that, but it's going to redouble its efforts in Gaza. Now, of course, by doing that, and there's this question of going into Rafah, uh, they could alienate the United States again. But I'm guessing that they'll be able to cut a deal with the U.S., but we shall see. Well, the American, British, and French Air Forces shot down some of those drones in coordination with Israelis. Almost all the more than 300 drones and missiles fired were intercepted, and that underscores an air defense system that's one of the strategic pillars of the U.S.-Israeli alliance. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger. Israel's most active and well-known air defense is Iron Dome. It sits alongside other missile defense systems like the Arrow to counter ballistic missiles and David Sling for medium-range rocket or missile attacks. Israel initially developed the Iron Dome alone after the 2006 Lebanon War and was later joined by the United States, which has provided know-how and billions in bipartisan financial support for the program. Virginia-based Raytheon helps to manufacture manufacture the Iron Dome. Jeff Bullinger, Bloomberg Radio. And the Washington Post is reporting the FBI has opened a criminal investigation focusing on the massive container ship that brought down the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore last month. Global News, 24 hours a day, whenever you want it, with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker. This is Bloomberg. Tom, John, and Lisa. Uh, thanks so much, John Tucker. Greatly appreciate it. Out on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast, an active live chat uh, this morning on what we witnessed this weekend, this historic moment for the Eastern Mediterranean. Coming up, Robert D. Kaplan. Coming up, Ian Bremmer. John Kirby of the White House. James Trevitas of the United States Navy.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We want to check back in with Goldman Sachs as earnings season continues. Right now, those shares are up more than 3%. Shares of its rival, Morgan Stanley, which is expected to report tomorrow their earnings, they're up more than 1%. We're still awaiting results from Charles Schwab and also MT Bank. As far as futures, they're advancing. We have NASDAQ futures up uh, six tenths of a percent right now, and Dow and SP futures up about half a percent. The two year yield at 4.96%, that's up about six basis points. The 10 year yield at 4.58%, and that's up about five basis points. Over to Nike, those shares up about half a percent. It's unveiling new products at a Paris event ahead of the Summer Olympics, trying to help boost sales. Their star attraction, the latest Pegasus running shoe. And apparently, Barbie mania not over. Mattel partnering with Kraft Heinz are going to produce a pink. Barbecue sauce. Can't make it up. Oh, Only in the UK and me. Spain. I thought it was going to be Barbie Velveeta. <laughs> no, that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Lisa Mateo, uh, thanks so much. Uh, beneath the headlines, it was a Paul Sweeney headline over the weekend. Netflix, they're suffering so badly. They've really made a sea change, Paul. Netflix is reorganizing, I'm going to say it as an amateur, their film decision, division rather. Yep. And it's going to be more about the audience and less about auteurs. I don't know what an auteur is. <laughs> this is in the New York Times. I think it might a, be an auteur. A tour is how you say audience after the third martini. <laughs> yeah. But, but what are they doing, Paul? They're on top. They're like everybody else, and they're cutting back a little bit on just the total dollars they're spending on programming. It's no longer an arms race to get as many subscribers as possible. You're focusing on profitability. It used to be if you were a filmmaker, you could just say, Hey, right. I've got an idea, go to Netflix, and boom, they write you a huge check. I, I watched this three-body problem. I'm not sure yet. I don't have a report folks on it other than it's a Game of Thrones guys who I greatly respect. But it's sort of sci-fi. i got to watch another episode Okay. You know, before right. I give it the Shogun seal of approval. I know. Approval. But got, again, yeah. it's, it's Netflix. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. It's good stuff, always. We'll see. We'll have much more on that here. A lot to talk about with Paul about the media um, as well. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Your daily look at the front pages around the world. It's brought to you by Interactive Brokers, their bond marketplace access, their vast selection of over 1 million global fixed income securities, no markups or built-in spreads, and low transparent commissions. Low transparent commissions. Learn more at IBKR. Dot com slash bonds. Sue Decker, XDLJ, Great, the best. iconic. The best. Sue Decker's on the board at Costco. She oh. emailed, she did like a DM, <laughs> like okay. not email, a DM on Twitter. I'm not sure what that is. To okay, Lisa, good. That's like a, where you talk inside. Oh, okay. right. To Lisa Mateo. The, did you really spend $500 at Costco? $580 Easy. to be exact. My, it's fair. Mrs. King's looking at your photo going, my God, we don't eat like that. They it's, eat healthy. It's my once a month kind of go in there. <laughs> and you got to stock up. I have the extra freezer. I have the extra fridge. You do? So, is that in the garage? So, do you put yes, those in the garage? Yes, I put them in the nice. garage. Yeah. And so they're that, there. Is that so where the beer is? That's where the beer okay, is. Okay, so I, when I come but over, Tom and I come over, yeah, we know where to go. But it's okay. healthy <laughs> beer. It's yeah. gluten-free beer. Sue Decker at Costco says thank you. What do you got? Yeah, that was quite a time. Uh, so we talked about Netflix. That one was crazy from the New York Times. I want to talk about, we've been talking so much about squatters. Yep. This one stood out to me yeah. from Business Insider. Squatters have taken over Gordon Ramsay's restaurant in London. Believe it or not, at least six people, they're living there outside York and Albany. This is according to the BBC, too. The restaurant was temporarily closed, so that's why this happened, and they're not sure when the squatters first showed up, but they're calling themselves the occupiers. They have a sign outside. They've posted a sign. They locked themselves inside. They boarded up the windows. They're threatening legal action against anybody who tries to kick them out. Ramsey's called the authorities about the property, but so far they're still there. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a small it's, matter. It's I mean, wild. And New York Mayor Adams is just focused on you know the rights of both sides of the transaction. I don't see it's, any. It's brutal. I don't. There was a Yahoo Finance chart out over the weekend on where the inflation is. Mm -hmm. Rent number two. Yep. Home ownership number three. That's all there is to it. I'm yep. sorry. Our audience know. is correct. This people we talk to are wrong. They're all micromanaging. 
inflation, I'm sorry, people are getting crushed. Yep, absolutely. You yeah. know, maybe groceries are better now, but I don't, I don't buy it. What else do you yeah. have? Uh, the New York Post, the once popular power lunch. Oh, Remember we've been talking. talking about, you know, people, maybe they're trickling back to the office. Apparently they're coming back because the power lunch is making a comeback. Okay, oh. this is according to Side Dish, a number of Midtown com uh, restaurants, newer hotspots. They're reporting the power lunch expanded, not just from Tuesday to Thursday, but five days a week. Really? Yeah, so they're enjoying the food. They're making big deals. And here's something interesting. Ladies who's lunch. Ladies who lunch. Oh, I love that. that. That is back. So the yep. women are making the deals too. They're going out for lunch more. Friday is the more popular lunch day because the workers don't go back to the office okay. after lunch. So you can kind of make a longer lunch, maybe two, three martinis. I I, I'm sorry, but good morning, Michael McCarty and Steve Millington. And I mean, the, bot the bottom line is there I was power lunching on Friday. Yep. I was stunned how busy it was given Wednesday's the new Friday. Nice. And I actually oh, was talking good. to Steve yep. about it. And you know, he totally agrees with what the New York Post is saying. There's just a, a new back. step, a new pop. Let's go. I hope it continues. I, yeah. I think people know how biased I am on this. I'll be at the L.A. Gourmet Deli power lunching today with my sandwich. But oh, I know yeah. usually I'm on Michael's time. That, that, that's my go-to spot. That's where the media folks hang out. That's like, you know, media. I, I just sit at the bar. I yep. don't, you know, like, you know who I saw there? Nick Colas. <laughs> Comes oh, up. yeah. Well, he's he was smart. in some intense private meeting. I yep. think he was trying to sell Google or something. But yep. Nick Colas came. He was there. Yeah, he's, He was having the green yeah, asparagus very with good. the French <laughs> sauce I can't pronounce. Next. <laughs> Fancy stuff. Uh, and this is the last one. It's it's a bit of a, a, a battle going on at the gym because a lot of these influencers uh, yeah. are taking their phones and they're filming themselves. And they're posting all these things. The people in the background, they don't want to be on their feed. So it's this back and forth thing about people saying, stop filming yourself at the gym enough of it already. Do you film yourself at the gym? Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, you're looking at us like you guys yeah. have no idea what we're talking about. We have no about. idea what you're talking about. Do you have your phone out at the gym, Lisa? Well, Our see, audience wants to know. The thing is, I, I work out at home. I yeah. don't go to the gym. And you've got the power gym. But, this and, is not like the Peloton, Tom, like or like the little walking on a treadmill. No, she's got like free like, weights and barbells. Yeah, it's, it's and like there's craziness. a house. It's like three houses down from Dan Loeb in the Hamptons. Yep. I, I don't know who owns it. Yep. And it's like literally 4,000 square feet. Of gym equipment. Yep. Do you have something like that? Um, not 4,000, but maybe a little, a, a little piece of that. But all of my friends who go to the gym, that's what they complain about. They're like, enough of this already. Like, do your workout. You're taking up my time on the bench. You're, you're, okay. you're doing this. and Because so you got to get your phone all set up and the, yeah, and the lighting and all and that kind of stuff. Okay, we're going to get serious here. And good morning, much. Jeremy Ither, who I adore out in Vancouver, is just phenomenal out on YouTube and has really helped me a lot in trying to keep this aged body going. Lisa, how long should you work out with weights? How many with minutes? With weights, no less than two days a week. Oh, no, he's, uh, Jeremy's nope. four days or more. Oh, there you well, go. This crazy person what is time? Yes, What's time? Five. I I'm see five. guys in the gym, and they're there for three hours. What no, are they doing? too much, too much. Yeah. They're, they're, they don't want to go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's their well, excuse. Well, how, how many minutes do you work out in a given day with weights? Me, 40 minutes. That's it. 40 minutes. 40 minutes. minutes. But today is today an arms day or a leg today day? Today is arms day. Today's yes, arms day. Shoulders and abs. Tom, after what's after the trip. Yeah, what's, what's for you? Arms I do, day, legs I do day? A hockey, I, no, seriously, I do a hockey workout. I do it in less than 20 minutes, and I get about 80%, 75% done, because I don't have time for this stuff. No, not please. Like no, you don't no. have to and, be there that long. And I, I am taking photos. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Tag me next so, time. So, <laughs> a, Pharaoh, Pharaoh still talks about being in the gym, because I'm actually lifting weights. Okay. The rest of them are doing three sets in that. What is, what is do, Pharaoh doing? I do like Nassim Taleb. <laughs> Nassim Taleb does this. You do like one set, get over it, and move on. I and that's know. it. I'm just going to follow Lisa. She's the expert oh, she's, in the room. Oh. Yeah. Yep. She's, she's All right, but, no, but, yes. but the bottom line is the bottom stop line filming yourself in the gym. Stop filming yourself. Okay. People are tired of it. They don't want to be seen. It's it's actually some legal issues, too, are starting to develop from this. So. Yeah, well, absolutely. Listen, I don't want to be in the background of, of your social media posts. Yeah, this is according to the Wall Street Journal. Okay, very good. Yes. All right, Lisa, okay. thank you so much. We thank you, Lisa. It. That was brilliant. Starting yeah. strong here uh, on the weekend. We are focused on the Eastern Mediterranean. The markets are focused, too, with a good tape. Brent crude, 89.79, not up, pretty much stable, and futures up half a percent as well. We say good morning to Boston. We're doing Boston music, yep. but we thought we'd go British because everybody up there, they're going to say at the end of the day, I ran. Flock of Seagulls, thanks for the suggestion out on YouTube live chat.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. We're addicted to the power of the game, the yep. Fed, the monetary ballet. Where do you see opportunities in a fixed income space here in 24? With Lisa Mateo on markets. AI affecting demand for cloud computing. And Michael Barr with news. Another legal setback for Donald Trump, this time across the pond. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. As Ed Yardini said in a note the weekend, it is the winds of war and how will it affect the markets? Good news for all of you. Markets are stable across equities, bonds, currencies, and commodities. Oil, 89.65 on Brent crude. Stable futures advance up 23 to up 27 in the last hour. Paul, our team has worked 24-7 yep. coming off of Sunday morning uh, early. In this hour, John Williams, the New York wow. Fed with our Michael McKee, Admiral Kirby of the White House with Amory Horton, Surveillance TV, and then also Robert D. Kaplan. We are so thrilled that he could come back after a yep, week absolutely. or two away. Yeah, and we have a lot to talk about on that geopolitical front, Tom. So we've got right the lineup uh, to talk about that. We're going to get right to that. I'm going to say good morning to you on Apple CarPlay. Thank you so much. Download the Bloomberg Business app, Apple CarPlay, growing each month. It is worldwide. It is safer, better. That's what Apple tells us. Sweeney has it. You should, sure. uh, too. YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. A fierce live chat out there. They they lit it up. I mentioned Sanka mm -hmm. last week. Oh, yeah? Lit it, lit it up for a discussion oh. on Sanka. There's an active live chat out on YouTube, which is a lot of fun and very international, very, very smart as well. We're in the Interactive Broker Studios. We say thank you to them uh, for their support, and particularly Bloomberg Surveillance this morning. We're brought to you by Cohn Resnick, Advisory Assurance Tax, Cohn Resnick, can help your business quantify its financial exposure using risk-based strategies wow. and analytics. Visit ConeResnick.com. A Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. Futures at Futures advancing as earnings season continues. We want to start with Goldman Sachs. They're up about 3.5%. Recorded a 28% jump in net income first quarter when analysts were actually expecting a drop from a year ago. Then we have M&T Bank. They're down about half a percent first quarter operating EPS. Well, that missed estimates. We're still waiting on Charles Schwab. Over to the yields. The two-year yield at 4.94%. That's up about five basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.57%. And that's up about five basis points as well. As for futures, NASDAQ futures, Dow and S&P futures all up more than half a percent right now. To commodities, oil, easing on that speculation that the conflict in the Middle East will remain contained. Right now we have Brent crude at $89 a barrel, NYMEX crude at $84 a barrel. And over to spot gold, that's higher at $2,358 an ounce. Apple shares down 1%. The company facing its worst iPhone slump since the COVID lockdowns. Its China rivals starting to rise. And then Tesla down nearly 1%. Elon Musk told workers in a memo the company will reduce its global headcount by more than 10%. And finally, Amazon. They installed more than 17,000 chargers at about 120 warehouses nationwide. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. In our last hour, we had Elliot Ackerman with us. His book of the summer was uh, Admiral Stravitas. Yep. Is 2054 off of 2034, which is about technology it is just simply this overwhelming technology i'm reading right now paul max hastings 900 pages on vietnam i'm really deficient on my vietnam knowledge okay and that's sort of where we realized we had no technology the bombing and all that and we had to discover the technology and now we're on to this new modern warfare as we saw this weekend let's fold this into the tapestry of the Eastern Mediterranean from Persia over on to Africa and Morocco. And you can only do that with Robert D. Kaplan, The Loom of Time, my book of the year last year. Folks, this is the one volume now you need to read to understand Arabia, Greater Arabia, and over to Persia. Robert Kaplan, thank you so much for returning to the show on such short notice. What did we learn about Iran's technology capability? Are they a medieval technology, or do they actually have ability? 
Um, they have a lot of ability. Um, remember, this is a, a, a Persian culture that is on the brink of, the, you know, of being able to deploy a nuclear bomb that's far ahead of any Arab state. On the other hand, what we learned this weekend was it was brilliant. Their hundreds of missiles and drone attacks on Israel were brilliantly deterred by the uh, by the uh, by the Israeli defense systems, the Iron Domes, the other anti-missile systems they have, with the help, and this is critical, Tom, with the help of the United States, uh, the West, and Jordan, and maybe some other Arab right. countries, which have not been uh, <clears throat> disclosed. So we've seen a new alliance almost, despite all the criticism of Israel right. for its invasion of Gaza. You lead your book with Edmund Burke, who we all were forced at gunpoint to read cover to cover. Robert D. Kaplan memorized it. With the rage and the frenzy out there, the basic Arab tribes, as a general statement, is stated by Robert T. Kaplan, have to have a rage and frenzy here towards Persia. How do they relate back to Israel if they have a rage and frenzy this morning over Tehran? Because uh, ultimately, despite everything uh, the Israeli military has done in Gaza, countries like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries see um, a, you know, a radical clerical regime in Iran as more of a danger to them than Israel. And when push comes to a shove, they will aid Israel. This is significant. So. Robert, I guess given the escalation, I guess as, as it were over the weekend, where do we go from here in this conflict here in the Middle East? I think a lot of folks are just saying, are we in a stalemate position here? Where do we go? I think the Israelis have the initiative at this moment. They took a big hit from, uh, from Iran and they completely deterred it. Uh, Iran has really nothing else it could do. The initiative, the ball is in Israel's court. It may very well wait to respond. It may not be a tit-for-tat respond. It may wait until their intelligence drives up more opportunities for assassinations of key Iranians. Um, you know, it may be, a, a, you know, a host of different things, but I think what the Americans are right. pressuring the Israelis to do, and by the way, America and Israel got closer over the weekend, as we saw, because again, push comes to a shove, the Biden administration militarily helped Israel. I How think what the Americans are telling the Israelis is, of course, you will respond. We understand you have to respond, but don't do it immediately and don't do it in terms of a spectacular big attack on Iran itself. Tell me about how Mr. Netanyahu changes in domestic politics. I mean, it's something I go to Ethan Bronner on in Tel Aviv, but Robert Kaplan, that's a fractious domestic politics for Mr. Netanyahu. How does he wake up? How does he adjust this morning? Um, look, Benjamin Netanyahu is someone who could deal with levels of stress that you and I cannot even imagine. I mean, seriously, he wouldn't be in the position he is if he couldn't do that. I think he's under pressure from his right wing, uh, you know, to respond spectacularly and immediately to this. Um, and uh, and of course, he wants to keep his coalition together because if elections were held soon, he would probably lose given his unpopularity. Right. Um, but on the other hand, he's you know, he has to satisfy the Americans because after after all, look what the United States did for him over this weekend, moving warships right. into the East Mediterranean, firing back. This was almost a joint Israeli-American response. What is the military response that Iran has now, or do they revert to what I'm going to call as an amateur, their traditional small guerrilla terrorism actions? Did they expend all their military material? I think they gave it a good, they, they did what they were able to do. 
But, you know, because here's what really happened. They were telegraphing for mid days upon days that they were going to strike Israel. And it was obvious that they were going to do it with missiles. And then, lo and behold, they do what they what what they had yeah. telegraphed ahead of time, what they were going to do. And it was completely deterred. Right. It was almost like a very orchestrated attack and an orchestrated right. um, r a response. I got eight other questions. Robert Kaplan, quickly here. I just got to get this in. How does this affect Russia? I haven't seen much about that. How does Mr. Putin adjust after a naval base in Syria after all this? Well, um, you know, Putin has, um, you know, Putin is dependent on Iran for the drones they are manufacturing for him in his war on Ukraine. He's dependent on Iran for munitions and artillery shells that they are manufacturing for him. You know, Ukraine has put him into the arms of Iran. Um, and so he, you know, it's not like he can play off Iran and right. Israel anymore like he used to before he invaded Ukraine. Thank you so much. On short notes, Robert T. Kaplan with us. And of course, folks, his book, uh, my book of the year, I can't, it's, it's the book, yep. about, Paul, you throw at the mouthy college student yeah, read who's this. lecturing yes. you because they saw something on, you know, Twitter or yep. things. Just shut up and read Kaplan. <laughs> exactly. The loom of time. Robert T. Kaplan, thank you so much. Futures advance up 28. Goldman Sachs with good earnings. With our news in New York City, John Tucker. All right, thanks, Tom. After Iran's weekend attack, Norman Rule with the Center for Strategic and International Studies says this is a new Middle East we're looking at. It's a Middle East in which Israel every day must wonder if some action might provoke an Iranian missile attack or drone attack on Israel's territory direct. And it also is a new Middle East in which Israel is now, in theory, open to do the same against Iran. The United States, Europe, the United Nations and others will certainly not want this to happen. But by allowing Iran to conduct an unprecedented attack, which was certainly not just symbolic, uh, you now have this new world. As Norman Rule with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He was a guest on Bloomberg Surveillance. You can hear the full conversation on the Surveillance Podcast. House Intelligence Chair Mike Turner says Israel needs more aid. On NBC's Meet the Press, he said he'd support a package that includes funds for Ukraine. We're at a critical point. Uh, Russia is beginning to gain ground. Ukraine is beginning to lose uh, the ability to defend itself. And the United States must step up and provide the Ukraine uh, the weapons that they need. And uh, uh, I think uh, we're going to see overwhelming support for that in the House this week. And you can hear Meet the Press and Face the Nation every Sunday on Bloomberg Radio. The FBI is conducting a criminal investigation into the deadly collapse of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge that's focused on the circumstances leading up to it and whether all federal laws were followed. This is according to people familiar with the matter, speaking to the Associated Press. The FBI was present aboard the cargo ship Dolly conducting court-authorized law enforcement activity, the agency saying in a statement that was posted today. Well, tight security planned for today's Boston Marathon with a heightened threat environment there. Olympic qualifier Connor Mance ran the marathon last year and is back in Boston as a spectator. It's amazing. The energy that comes with the Boston Marathon is unmatched anywhere. And so, you know, while I would love to be running the marathon, I just, just can't do it with the Olympics coming up. But I'm so happy to be here. The Boston Marathon, by the way, started in 1897. Tom was one of the runners. Global News, <laughs> 24 hours a day, whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. I talked to my friend Ted. I said, you know, one year I tried to run it, and I looked at my left ankle and said, no, I don't think no, so. Thanks. No, thanks. Paul, we haven't talked about the two-year yield. We're like heading up five beeps. We're getting back to 5%. We are, Tom. 4.95% on the two-year, up five basis yeah. points today here. Um, and, you know, the Fed is talking about... Yeah. They're still talking about rate cuts, but the market's, you know, uh, a little bit skeptical here. John Williams with Michael McKee. That's in this hour. John Kirby of the White House. John Williams of the New York Fed. Where else? Bloomberg Surveillance. We say good morning to you.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures advancing. We have NASDAQ, Dow, S&P futures all up more than half a percent. This after profits at Goldman Sachs blew past expectations. Right now, those shares are up about 4%. Charles Schwab, M&T Bank didn't fare as well. Charles Schwab, Charles Schwab is down about 1%. M&T is down about half a percent. Over to the bond market, the two-year yield at 4.95%. That's up about five basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.58%, and that's up about five basis points. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate it, uh, Lisa and Matteo. Here's what we're going to do. We've got John Williams coming along in 20 minutes with Michael McKee, Amory Horton leading a good-spirited conversation with John Kirby, Admiral Kirby, former assistant of the Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. He's, of course, uh, with uh, uh, the, the White House, essentially. But before that, we're going to stay on the markets here with Chuck Lieberman, who's been a student of the markets uh, for years. Chuck, we've got too short a time with you this morning into Admiral uh, Kirby and the war events. With emotions like our geopolitics of the time, Chuck Lieberman, how do you stay invested? Well, you have to think longer term. Um, obviously, the short term is going to be pretty volatile, lots of stuff going on. But you know, the truth of the matter is that's normal for the market. Uh, we're dealing with stuff all the time. So you just have to keep that longer term perspective. Hey, Chuck, we're right smack in the middle, middle of these bank earnings here. I, talk to us about Citigroup. That's a, I used to work there. It's my firm. It's an alma mater of mine. But it's, it's a bank that's just trying to get it right. What did you see? Well, I think they're making real progress. Uh, everyone's been waiting to see the results of all of the efforts. Uh, that have been put in over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and it sure looks like uh, Joan Frazier is making tremendous progress. Uh, I think that's why uh, the stock uh, held up the way it did on Friday. Uh, it's uh, suggesting that uh, they're going to continue to see some moderation in their cost structure. Uh, they're certainly getting rid of a lot of the uh, overseas stuff. Uh, so I think it's very, very promising. Um, and it looks like the restructuring is taking right. hold. Uh, I, I, I've got to ask you, Chuck Lieberman, about the Yardeni and Kampura bull market we're in. Do you share the enthusiasm of a, little, a linear, linear production higher here in what tech does? Well, in my mind, it's never going to be linear. Uh, it's just always going to be a, a sawtooth pattern. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if you look away from the Magnificent Seven, uh, the rest of the market, I, in my judgment, is reasonably value. And that means that as long right. as corporate earnings continue to do well, which is what I expect for 2024, in fact, as you go further into the year, the outlook gets better and better. So as far as I'm concerned, we have conflicting forces working on the market, higher rates are a headwind, but the underlying economy and corporate profits are right. a tailwind. Chuck, and, thank and you. Well, we're going to have positive. to leave it there because of what's going on in, in Israel. Chuck Lieberman, thank you so much. Advisors, uh, Capital Management today. And now, our John Farrow in conversation with Admiral Kirby. Uh, I believe the War Cabinet is still deliberating and uh, making their decisions. Uh, the President had a, uh, a very good conversation with the Prime Minister uh, right after or towards the end of the attacks on Saturday night. Uh, and the President uh, was uh, was very direct that uh, this was a, a huge success uh, that uh, that Israel can be proud that it doesn't stand alone and that it has superior military capability. Iran utterly failed in what they were trying to achieve, uh, and that that success alone sends a strong message to Iran and to the region uh, about Israel's place there. Sir, could we just define success? How can we define the weekend's events as a success? To see the first direct strikes coming from Iranian soil. Yeah. on Israel. How is that a success in any way, yeah. shape or form? Yeah, let's, let's talk about what didn't happen. Uh, not, not, uh, no, hardly any damage. Uh, and the only uh, impacts were to uh, uh, an air base uh, in uh, central Israel. Uh, no real casualties except, sadly, uh, a young civilian girl uh, was critically injured. Um, uh, and the vast majority, as the IDF have said, 99% of what Iran threw up in the air, drones and missiles, never landed. Uh, 
either failed or actually got shot down. So that's what didn't happen. And what did happen was Israel proved it has superior military capability and just as critically, they don't stand alone, that the United States, stand, the United States stands with them. I think people are maybe um, uh, uh, not cognizant of the fact that the president put U.S. forces in harm's way to help defend Israel for the first time. American fighter pilots in the air shooting things down that were heading towards Israel. That's, uh, that, and, and they were extraordinarily successful in doing so. I think that's significant. You're talking about a successful defense. I think a lot of people also focus, focused on the unsuccessful deterrence. The president said don't, and they did. And we're trying to work out, Admiral Kirby, in what way the U.S. is able to influence Iranian behavior. Well, the president pre-positioned military forces in the region, which allowed for that unprecedented successful defense. Uh, the president uh, met with the G7 leaders yesterday uh, to talk about a unified diplomatic response and to consider other options and uh, alternatives to try to hold Iran accountable for what uh, it did on Saturday night. Uh, Iran is increasingly isolated in the world, certainly in the region, uh, and Israel has proven that it has friends. If Israel does not respond, is the new status quo that Iran can strike Israel from its own soil and there won't be a retaliation? Uh, again, I can't speak to that, Anne-Marie. That's going to be up to the prime minister and the war cabinet to, to make those decisions. We respect that, uh, that, that it's a sovereign nation and they have to make those decisions. There's lots of reporting that the Biden administration, though, is verbalizing to the Israelis that they, they do not support a counter strike. Isn't that, in a sense, taking one of those tools out of the toolbox and brandishing it to the world? Uh, the tools that we took out of the toolbox were pretty significant on Saturday night, Anne-Marie. Uh, uh, ballistic missile destroyers uh, in the Eastern Med helping shoot down ballistic missiles, uh, fighter aircraft in the air, uh, other partners participating. There was a lot of tools in the toolbox and that, was, that there's no question that Iran recognizes uh, uh, the coalition that was put together uh, to, help, uh, to help Israel defend itself. Again, I, I can't speak for what either side will do going forward. All I can do is speak for President Biden as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, he has since October 7th, and he will continue going forward, making sure that we are meeting our commitments to Israel, but just as critically that we're meeting our commitments to our own national security interests in the region, uh, making sure we have the resources in place to protect our troops, our facilities, and the missions that we're conducting there in the Middle East. We've had 60 tons of arsenal fired upon Israel directly from Iran. We've had six months of Iranian-backed Houthis hitting as well, trying to hit even U.S. vessels in the Red Sea and disrupting global trade. We also had an uptick of uh, uranium enrichment by Iran. So to get to this deterrence, what is the U.S. willing to do? We have sanctions in place. Is the United States willing to enforce them? We have been enforcing sanctions. I mean, my goodness, in the three and a half years of this administration, uh, we have implemented more than 50 sanction regimes targeting more than 500 uh, entities and individuals. Uh, and again, I won't preview uh, coming sanctions uh, or anything like that, but I can tell you that uh, additional sanctions are certainly not off the table in terms of holding Iran accountable. Uh, and take a look at the additional military resources that President Biden has added to the region, even before October 7th. Uh, this is something that he's been keenly focused on. Uh, and as we saw from Saturday night, Iran is increasingly isolated on the world stage. Uh, they are increasingly uh, making it harder for anybody in the international community uh, to be sympathetic to any of their uh, inimical interests there. So again, I think we've done a lot. We'll continue to look at our options going forward. Uh, and I suspect that uh, we'll continue to, to hold Iran properly accountable. Admiral Corby, how are they isolated? They had a call with the Saudis. They're sending all their oil to China. They're sending Shahad drones to Russia. In March, Iranian oil output hit a five-year high. Where is the enforcement? There is enforcement of the sanctions, Anne-Marie. Again, this is one of the most heavily sanctioned countries in the world. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to look at our options uh, going forward to hold them properly accountable. The sanctions are certainly not off the table. Neither is going to making sure that we've got the capabilities uh, in the region, and we do, uh, to thwart some of their destabilizing activity. You talked about the uranium enrichment. Um, when the previous administration pulled out of the Iran deal, uh, it vastly accelerated the degree to which uh, Iran could start to spin up their centrifuges and get closer to some sort of breakout capability. The president obviously tried. We tried tried, but Iran was not negotiating in good faith to get back into that Iran deal. But he also made clear uh, that we will not allow Iran to achieve a nuclear weapons capability. We prefer to do that through, through diplomacy. But if not, we've got other 
options available well, to us. Well, what's diplomacy? Bob Malley, the Iranian envoy, is still under investigation. Who is leading these diplomatic efforts? As I said, the diplomatic efforts to get them back into the Iran deal are, are no longer being pursued because Iran wasn't negotiating in good faith, which is why uh, we're going to make sure we have other options available to us to prevent them from achieving a nuclear weapons capability. Admiral, one question, and Emory did touch on this, this question around uh, what the response could be to Iran seizing a vessel in the Straits of Hormuz, the idea of freedom of the seas. What's the U.S.'s response to that, given the fact that a lot of companies have already started to rejigger some of their trade routes? and bake in extra costs as a result. Yeah, I, uh, I had a little trouble hearing you over the lawnmower there, but I think I got the gist of the question. Uh, we certainly condemn this most recent maritime attack. This is uh, uh, a tactic that the Iranians have used in the past. Um, we have, when able, uh, been able to interdict, been able to try to thwart uh, uh, other such maritime attacks, uh, not all of them, of course, uh, and we are also making a concerted effort over time, and we have been somewhat successful uh, in intercepting uh, goods that uh, the Iranians have been trying to ship by sea uh, to some of their proxies well, in Iraq and Syria and certainly the Houthis. Admiral, one thing that a lot of companies are saying, and a lot of executives, is that they do have to make contingency plans because they aren't sure that there can be such safety and you've seen insurance costs go up. Is it appropriate yeah. for the U.S., for Israel, to more directly respond to Iran at some point, just not now? Uh, again, I can't speculate about future operations one way or another or future decisions that we might have to make. The president has been clear. We're going to hold Iran accountable for their destabilizing activities. He's also been clear that we don't want a war with Iran. We're not looking for a, another war in the Middle East or to see the conflict that's currently underway in Gaza broadened or, or deepened across the region. Now, we'll have to see how things unfold over the next coming uh, days here. Uh, but uh, we don't want a war with Iran. And everything the president has been doing since the 7th of October has been designed to try to bring the tensions down and to make sure that the United States is best postured to defend our interests there in the region. You're in a fight now with a lawnmower, sir, so we're going to let you go. <laughs> National Security Council Communications Advisor John Kirby. John, thank you, sir. Admiral Kirby, and you know, we the White the House has the same mowers as they do at, the, at Augusta. Yeah. I mean, they're out there with the, remember the lock mowers of Connecticut? Yep. I, you, I, you, I had one at one point, actually, the fancy, fancy. That's classic. Admiral, Admiral Kirby is, is wonderful, folks. He's yep. got some real wartime duty. It is very rare to have a spokesman of that sophistication from either party at the White House. John Farrell, Anne-Marie Horton, Lisa Bramowitz in conversation, a brief from the lawn of uh, the White House. We have a very busy agenda. Right to it, a Bloomberg Business Flash. Lisa Mateo. You got it. A NASDAQ down and S&P futures. They're all up more than half a percent. This is after profits at Goldman Sachs blew past expectations, recorded a 28 percent jump in net income in the first quarter. Those shares are up about nearly 4 percent right now. Charles Schwab, M&T Bank. Well, they didn't fare as well. Charles Schwab down about 1 percent. M&T down about half a percent. Over to the two-year yield at 4.95 percent. That's up about five basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.58 percent, and that's up about five basis this point to commodities nymex crude right now at 84 dollars a barrel brent crude at 89 dollars a barrel and we have spot gold higher at 2357 an ounce companies making the news it's a boost for samsung the biden administration well they plan to warn the company as much as 6.4 billion dollars in grants that's to increase chip production in texas and then we'll stick with tech we'll go to meta platforms who actually wants to bring Facebook. its virtual reality headset into classrooms by the fall for kids as young as 13. Oh, that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Alisa, thanks so much. Our economic indicators all through the week, the month, the year, economic indicators this Monday brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com wow. to learn more. Paul Sweeney with the editorialization wow. of the strength <laughs> of the American consumer. Why are you wowing, Mr. Sweeney? I'm seeing some really strong retail sales out there, Tom. Retail sales month on month up 0.7%. Uh, Consensus was 0.4%. Uh, and it was 0.6% last month. So really strong retail sales. Uh, you, you back out the, uh, you know, the auto and the gas and all, all that right. kind of, you go to the control group, 1.1% growth. The consensus was 0.4% growth. So retail sales 
very healthy out there. Marcus Fed VIX comes in from a 17 level to 16.77. This is the one Fed official to really lean on. Lobach Williams is prodigious chops on what the run rate of the economy is, how our underlying yep. monetary theory works. John Wilson, uh, John Williams, I should say, out of Berkeley and Stanford, two colleges across pretty good, the bay. Pretty good. It's sort of like Oakland, San Francisco, but more congenial. <laughs> John Williams is at the New York Fed with that unique position in conversation with Michael McKee. And for those of you out on YouTube, I can only say this is the one Fed speak that really matters are Michael McKee with a gentleman from Stanford. Good morning, everybody. And we'd like to thank John Williams for joining us on Bloomberg Radio and Television Worldwide. John, uh, numbers just came out pretty amazing. Uh, are you continually surprised by the American consumer? Well, first of all, welcome to the New York Fed. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary of, of this building here on Liberty Street. Um, so, yeah, the consumer spending has been strong. I think it is driven by strong fundamentals. Job growth has been solid. We've seen real wage gains. We're in a pretty strong economy with good growth. So, yes, it's, it's part of that story. But, uh, you know, we, I think what we're realizing is we're getting a nice... Uh, tailwind from the supply side of the economy. Good uh, labor force growth, strong productivity, good real wage gains. So with that, I think, you know, consumers are, are spending. What's the thinking in your office and among your colleagues about does this last or is this a surprise that you think could go away at any minute? Well, I, one thing that makes it really hard to forecast is we're still feeling the effects of the, pan, the after effects of the pandemic and Russia's war in Ukraine and all the things that have happened in between. So we're definitely still seeing an adjustment process by the consumer, by in the economy overall. Um, but you know, overall, I think that the economy will continue to grow at a, a solid rate this year, probably not as high as the 3.1% we saw last year, but something like 2% or, or around that. So I feel like we're still in a, a good place, probably not as rapid a growth as we saw last year. Uh, speaking of international events, I have to ask you, uh, the Middle East going on right now, how do you think about the economic and policy uh, implications of these events? Right. So obviously we're watching this uh, very carefully. I think the primary way you see it through now is, uh, first of all, through commodity prices. Uh, but second is, you know, what we think of as a, a flight to safety, where investors, uh, when they see risks uh, in the global economy, they tend to bring money to, to the U.S. dollar, uh, and that tends to push yields down somewhat. Right now, I think, you know, markets are pretty pretty stable. We're not seeing big movements in that way. But generally, that's the way I, I would, uh, what I would expect to see when you see heightened geopolitical uh, tensions. When you think about uh, what the markets are reacting to and what could come out of this, is this more of an inflation worry or a growth concern? Well, I, I, it's really hard to say. It really depends on how uh, the situation evolves. Uh, right now, I don't think of this as maybe in the near term, uh, it could be uh, effect of financial conditions and, and commodity prices, as I mentioned. I don't see this as a major driver of the overall uh, forecast for, or outlook for uh, economic growth or for inflation. Speaking of inflation, CPI came in much hotter than expected and uh, sort of freaked everybody out on Wall Street. And markets sort of took that as a turning point in Fed policy. Do you see it that way? I don't see it as a turning point. I think that, you know, we've, we saw inflation come down maybe quicker than we expected last year. We uh, definitely saw really uh, lower readings in inflation in the, in the final six months. That I never thought that that was going to stay that low, um, that it was kind of unusually low. We're now seeing some uh, unu a little bit unusually high readings. Uh, overall, I think the picture is, is, is one of that the economy is getting in better balance. Uh, we still have a strong labor market, and we're seeing inflation gradually come down. Now, I do think that, you know, the, you know, for me, what do I see in the data? Well, the economy, and then you pointed out the, you know, retail sales today, but more broadly, the economy continues to be strong. Again, I think we're being helped by strong demand and supply, and those are uh, helping, you know, growth. Um, and we're seeing, you know, inflation come down a little bit uh, slower than expected. And so, you know, I think markets are taking all of that information into account and how they, how they expect policy. Policy to be for me, I'm you know data dependent. Is always really take the totality of the data and think about what it means for achieving our maximum employment and price stability goals. So I don't see this as a, a game changer or anything. I do think it's 
important information that will clearly, uh, you know, affect our, uh, my thinking and, and my forecast. Even those who've thought about what PCE might be after the PPI and CPI say inflation isn't coming down rapidly anymore, but you do have the strong growth, you have very low unemployment. Why cut rates if the economy is doing fine at this level? Well, first of all, I think monetary policy is working at the rates that we have now. So I think uh, I think monetary policy is in a good place. Over the past six, you know, 12 to 18 months, we've seen all pretty much all the measures of imbalances in the labor market and our, and our economy recede, many of them back to levels we saw in 2018 or 2019. So we're seeing the, you know, restoring balance in the economy, we are seeing a slow uh, decline in, in inflation. So I do think monetary policy right now is in a, in a good place. I'm not fixated on where do rates need to go, uh, you know, over the next year. What I'm focused on is what, how do we best achieve our, our maximum employment and price stability goals. The data we're seeing show that the economy is strong, and that's really good news, and labor market strong. At the same time, we are getting better balance, and we're seeing some decline overall in inflation. So for me, it's really about getting that right, and then whatever we need to do to adjust monetary policy, uh, we can do uh, to be, you know, best continue uh, the progress towards our goals. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about it, and uh, we'll just have to keep watching the data and make the decisions based on those goals. Well, is your base case that you will cut rates this year? My own view is I think that with inflation continuing to gradually come down, and I guess I would say gradually is the operative word here, um, and with the economy remaining strong, I do think that given where the level of rates are, uh, real interest rates now are, are, are considerably higher than they were before because inflation has come down quite a bit. Uh, so we will need to uh, start a process at some point to bring interest rates back to more normal levels. And my own view is that we will, you know, that process will likely start this year. Um, but again, it's going to be driven driven by the data um, and achieving our goals. So it's possible you don't do anything this year. Well, again, you're asking me to speculate on what, sure. the, what will happen over the next eight months. <laughs> of course. And you know, right now, I think monetary policy is in a good place. We're 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 seeing the progress. We're seeing progress. Uh, it's a bumpy uh, road on on the inflation front, and we'll just have to figure out how to best adjust policy uh, as needed to achieve our goals. Well, you mentioned the uh, real rate. Is policy tight now? I do think we have restrictive monetary policy. I do think policy is tight. So how do I, what do I look for? Because uh, the economy is growing. It grew over 3%. You know, we're adding uh, about, what, 275,000 jobs over the first three months. So that seems like an economy that's really strong and not being held back by monetary policy. But if you take a step back, all these measures of imbalances in the labor market, whether job openings or wage rates or quits rates or all the other indicators we look at, all of them are moving from being very tight to less tight, and most of them back to more strong labor market or getting closer there. I mean, job openings are still high, wage growth is still a bit high, but these are all moving in the right direction. So I think the stance of monetary policy has really been an important driver of, re of restoring balance to the economy and helping bring inflation uh, to two towards two percent. Well, what's left with inflation? Is it? Uh, something that you can affect, uh, or are these non-interest rate responsive sectors? You know, monetary policy can affect inflation in the economy. It, it works through multiple channels. So there are some sectors that maybe are not as interest sensitive, but the economy is interest rate sensitive. We've seen that over the past couple of years as we've you know, moved from accommodative policy to a restrictive policy. So monetary policy is working. I expect it to continue to work to, to bring inflation down. It, you're going to see it uh, you know, show up in different parts of the inflation rates, you know, goods versus services and things. But over the past year, year and a half, we have seen a broad-based decline in inflation in all of these categories. It's just that we haven't gotten all the way to 2%, and we just need to keep, uh, keep policy in the right place to achieve that 2% goal. question I always ask is, what are CEOs, companies telling you these days about their hiring plans, about what they're having yeah. to pay, and about inflation, whether they're raising prices or having to pay higher prices? Well, clearly, if you asked me this question a year or two ago, that's all they would be talking about. Price increases, compensation increases, the challenges of hiring uh, employees. Today, I think those, uh, you know, those comments are, are still out there a little bit, but far less than before. We're hearing from our contacts, uh, you know, that it's easier to fill positions than it used to be. Wage uh, compensation pressures are less and price pressures are, are less. I think that's consistent with what we're seeing overall in the data. You're the potential growth guy. Has potential growth moved up? 
You know, I am be getting more optimistic about potential uh, growth in the economy, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, through the pandemic and everything that happened after that, I, like most people, had concerns that the supply side of the economy had, had suffered, you know, damage, uh, the labor force in, in terms of labor force and participation. And, 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 you know, as we've watched the data over the past two years, we've seen an you know, increase in labor force participation, increase in labor force growth, and we've seen a rebound in productivity. Now, I'm not saying that we're in some, you know, a new high growth uh, uh, kind of a world, but I do think a potential growth is probably closer to 2% or a little higher, which is well above a lot of estimates of the past uh, few years. And that's a very positive sign for, for U.S. real incomes and for the economy, and honestly, for helping get uh, inflation down. A question for all of our friends uh, around us on trading desks. <laughs> you had a briefing on QT uh, at the last meeting from the Fed staff, and members, according to the minutes, generally agreed that it should start soon. Does that mean May or does that mean June? Well, I think we said fairly soon, and, and uh, the uh, you know I think that the reasoning for uh, slowing the the pace of reduction of our balance sheet uh, makes a lot of sense. It's a prudent uh, course of action. Uh, we are decreasing the balance sheet quite rapidly, and and by slowing that, we'll have more ability to monitor, assess, and analyze as we get eventually to an ample reserves uh, kind of world that we're aiming for. Everything is going with the balance sheet. Uh, everything is going exactly as planned. Things are going well. When we decide to, uh, you know, slow the pace of the balance sheet, that's a decision for the committee. No decision was made at the last meeting, but obviously we'll get together relatively soon and, and discuss this further. But to me, this is a sign of success of the plans we laid out almost two years ago to reduce the balance sheet. We've had very little disruption in, in markets. It's, it's worked uh, exactly as planned, and we're just executing on that plan, and that's going very smoothly. So QT could come before break. Boots. Yeah, these are really separate issues. I mean, on our, our shrinking the balance sheet, we're focused on getting to ample reserves. On monetary policy, we're very focused on achieving our maximum employment and price stability goals. Those are different objectives. Those instruments uh, can obviously move at different times in different ways. John Williams, thank you very much. President of the New York Federal Reserve, we'll send it back up to you. I'm Michael McKee with John Williams uh, this morning here in an extremely busy hour. Here's what we're going to do forward. We welcome all of you, Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney here on YouTube. Really loving that Bloomberg podcast is how you search for us. And again, live chat, more than uh, intelligent uh, this morning and very international, I should say. What we're going to do off bang up retail sales and futures yes, going, wow. what, Paul, negative 20, uh, positive 23 to positive 38. Dow futures up 300 is get the pulse of the American consumer. And we can do that by looking down 57th Street from Lewis Vuitton in the FT article this weekend <laughs> in Arno to the 9 million square foot new Dior store yep. that's out there, except that's not American consumption. Dana Telsey owns the high ground here and she joins us right now. Dana, I've got a predilection to talk about luxury. That is separate from American consumption. How's the American consumer doing? I think overall, today's retail sales were much better than expected, a stronger number. March is the most important month of the quarter, especially since you had Easter in it. But I think also, if you see some of the things in terms of wage growth outpacing inflation, that's been a benefit and causing even some of the lower income consumers to spend. But overall, I believe the consumer is still squishy. I don't squishy. think you're seeing particular strength in yeah. any one category except for what we're seeing from off pricers and i think the focus is on the search for value what's it mean for walmart i think walmart's a share gainer i think target's a share gainer look what costco's results were last week they're gaining share and i think it means good things for the off pricers also like tj maxx ross stores in burlington dana if, if the walmart's in, a, in the targets of the world are gaining share Who's losing share in this marketplace? Take a look at what we have some, from some of the department stores. It's been weaker in some of the department store areas. We've had some companies not performing as well. We've seen that in some of the weaker players. For example, Home Furnishings is still working to see some signs of improvement and see an uptick there. Now that you're having housing bottoming, that should hopefully be an uptick. And also we've s seen some in apparel that still have a ways to go. We're still waiting to see any signs of improvement 
at companies like Victoria's Secret. So how about just, as Tom mentioned earlier, to start off the segment here on the luxury side, what are we seeing there if I walk down Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue today? Well, we're going to know a lot more tomorrow, given that LVMH reports okay. their sales tomorrow at noon. But I think luxury is slowed. I've walked down 57th Street, as has Tom, <laughs> walked in and spoken to all the sales associates I know at many of those stores on 57th Street. Right. And they're not seeing the abundance of tourists that you typically have. You're not seeing even the locals spend to the same degree that they right. have spent in the past. They're definitely perhaps spending on vacations and going abroad rather than spending on some of the right. items here and the luxury goods items. And the one that seems to continue to defy gravity, Tom, is Hermes. It's amazing to see, and I'm going to shout out to the FT with a wonderful uh, work through of the Arnaud family and, and what uh, Louis Vuitton, LVMH, is looking at. Dane, I got one time, I got one more question because we've got to go to Dr. Bremer here on the Eastern Mediterranean. Where are our department, to Paul's good question, where are our department stores in five years or 10 years? I don't get it. I think, and I agree. I think. Oh, we got some audio problems with Dana. We'll let her go there. We'll work on that. Rich, be sure that surveillance pays a bill on that. <laughs> you know, you know, Red Keeper, the Amex said that, you know, I can pick that up. She's in the Gucci store, so she's like, maybe. Yeah, she's probably, yeah, exactly. Channel she's checks. probably yep. she's doing channel checks already uh, this morning. Bloomberg surveillance on this eventful Monday. It's brought to you by Interactive uh, uh, Brokers. Discover the future of trading with their next generation trading platform. IBKR Desktop. Download IBKR Desktop at IBKR.com slash desktop. And we thank Interactive Brokers for their commitment to our conversation. I thought of Ian Bremer four or five, six times this weekend yep. because you need to describe our G0 certitude, our comfort, our lack of warfare on the soil of the United States, and then other G7 nations with what's going on out there. He codified the phrase G0, and we're honored that Dr. Bremer could join us uh, this morning. What does the G7 do here of you know, a Kissingerian diplomacy, Ian? You gotta show up and be diplomatic if you can't talk to the other side. How does, should the G7 respond? They're showing as much support as they can uh, for the defense of Israel. Uh, and, and that is uh, both intended to show Israel that they are not isolated in the global uh, stage, despite the war in Gaza and all of the opposition to that war over the past months. But the Iranian strikes, uh, in a sense, um, are the higher priority uh, for the G7. Uh, but that they don't want to see, they really resist, mm -hmm the potential for Israel to engage in strikes against Iran that could precipitate a direct war. And right now, I would argue, you've got Benny Gantz largely sympathetic to that message, someone that would like to be the next prime minister uh, of Israel, and he has a vote on that war cabinet. And you've got Benjamin right. Netanyahu, um, who is fighting for his political right. life and is not sympathetic to that argument. Uh, Gantz is saying this is the time that you should strengthen alliances with countries like the U.S. and Germany. And Netanyahu is saying this is the time we've got to hit the Iranians back directly right. and hard, even if that means a more isolated and a more right. unilateral Israel. That, well, that is the nature of the debate right. inside Israel right now. And what's so important here, folks, you know, you see Ian Bremer and he's doing this media, that media, he's writing this book, and what you don't see is the granularism of his daily Eurasia note. And part of that, Ian, is about the structure of the Iranian government and a theocracy. Who's calling the shots in Iran right now? Do they have a legitimate government or is it a theocracy that staggers back to 1979? Look, you, you know that um, they don't have a legitimate government in the sense that the people don't have a voice. They don't have the ability to vote for them or vote them out. Uh, and indeed, uh, there have been a lot of people, myself included, that have both believed and hoped 
that people power uh, would be more successful in rising up against this brutal theocratic regime. But it is in place. It is stable. It is calling the shots internationally and domestically. And it does not want a war with the United States. Uh, and so I, I look, I think the important thing I've been seeing on the media over the weekend, please, you know, how extraordinary it was that the Israelis were able to defend so well against 300 Iranian missiles and drones that they knocked down 99% of them and there were not any deaths, there were not any significant injuries. And that's a great story. But let us remember that the Iranians gave a heads up as to the nature and the timing of the attack to the Iraqis. Why did they do and that? To the Turks. Okay, stop, Ian. Why did they do that? Flying over Iraq and Jordan. Why does the Iranians give it away? It's like pretend war. Well, yeah, because I think they were trying to accomplish two things that are hard to do at the same time. They were trying to show a maximum display of force in responding to the Israeli strikes on Damascus that killed a high-level Iranian military official. Um, and they were trying to minimize the likelihood that their show of force led to further attacks and brought them into a war they don't want to fight. So th those, those two goals that they have are not exactly fully in alignment, Tom, right? And so what, what, what they did um, was they, they tipped their cards, they showed their hand through the Turks and the Iraqis to the Americans. So the United States had the ability to send the CENTCOM commander to Israel um, to, to coordinate a response, to get your vessels and your aircraft in place in advance, to let the Israelis know what was going to happen. Um, to tell the Israelis privately and publicly that there was ironclad support for Israeli defense. In other words, give the Israelis a bear hug. Yep. Help defend them as best you can, but also help constrain them and constrain specifically the prime minister in making it hard for him to engage in full-throated right. military response following this Iranian attack. That's exactly what the Iranians were hoping to accomplish. By the way, it was also following the US playbook in the one week following the Iranian proxy attacks that killed three American servicemen and women in Jordan. The, the, the Americans did the same thing. And so I'm sure that the Iranians figured, because it's a dangerous thing for them to do, it worked for America. The U.S. is going to get it if we do the same thing in response. Ian, we're six months into this conflict here. I think I speak for a lot of folks when I say we just have no idea how Israel will get out of this situation today versus day one. How do you think this plays out going forward? Uh, I, I think most people are focused on Iran right now and less on Gaza. Uh, that will, uh, of course, change back uh, given the nature of the uh, horrible civilian right. casualties, the famine that's going on, and the rest. But this does give the Israeli prime minister and his right-wing government um, uh -huh. more of a lease on life. They're likely uh -huh. to be there for longer as opposed to forced out soon. That's a problem for Biden. Right. There's less focus on Gaza, which means that Netanyahu is going to have a harder time um, being restrained uh, in terms of eventual uh -huh. ground assault on Rafah. I, I suspect it will be less dramatic, less overwhelming than right. he might have wanted to do before the U.S. ultimatum, and there'll be more humanitarian mm -hmm. aid coming in. But I think those attacks are still happening, especially because it's harder to now get the Hamas breakthrough on the initial hostage release in mean, the six-week season. Ian, get some rest. You've been up all weekend. Ian Bremmer there, owning the high ground on our G0 realities. Dr. Bremmer, of course, with Eurasia Group, look to his top 10 risks at the beginning of the year. Important read and also shockingly informative uh, as well. I guess retail sales, I mean, Telsey's in charge of this with her channel checks with Joe Feldman. She seemed to say a wow nominal statistic. Look at the, we're back to 5,200 SPX. I know. I mean, look Let's at this. Let's see. 97% drones or whatever, 300 ballistic missiles, whatever the data is, and the market's up 
Yeah. SPX up 41 on futures. Yeah, it's just amazing. Again, we I had that sell-off so. on Friday there, yeah. um, but again, kind of kind of a rebound here. So we talk about some of these drawdowns uh, that some people that have been looking for for this market, you generally just don't get them. You get a day or two of, of red tape time, right. and then we see the buyers come back in. Boston Marathon morning. today. I was going to run it, but, you know, <laughs> last time I ran it, the cars were, you know, number one. Wait, I never ran it. <laughs> Good morning, Boston. Red Sox, 11, 10 a.m.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning across the nation and worldwide. As Ed Yardini said over the weekend, it is, as Herman Vogt told us, the winds of war. We've been working all weekend to inform you on what we see in the eastern Mediterranean over to Persia and also to stay on Goldman Sachs earnings. Huge, huge success for David Solomon. Stock up nicely. And, of course, retail sales, as Dana Telsey said, a surprise. Futures on relief of the effort of Israel and its allies up 41, Dow futures up 39. We're going to keep this real quick this morning on Apple CarPlay and YouTube. Uh, Paul Sweeney, just a, an overweight of news this morning. Overweight of news, geopolitical news. Tom, we've had a great roster of guests. We have more coming up with Admiral Stravitas, but geopolitics front and center. In addition to earnings, and in addition to some of those retail sales uh, we got today, it's a lot for investors to digest. We're going to get right to it. I mean, it's just really, really important that we keep uh, the discussion uh, going going here as, as well. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning uh, brought to you by Build America Mutual, insures U.S. municipal bonds that finance essential American infrastructure and provides guaranteed income to improve any portfolio. Be part of the Building America Invest in BAM insured bonds. Thank you, Build America uh, Mutual, for your support. A market brief, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. Yeah, we have a nice lift to the markets. Right now we have NASDAQ and Dow futures and S&P futures all up eight tenths of a percent. Earnings season continues. Goldman Sachs reporting net revenue of the first quarter. The beat estimates right now, those shares up about 4%. Charles Schwab, M&T Bank didn't fare as well their shares right now. We have Charles Schwab down more than 1%. M&T down about half a percent. We also received more economic data. Retail sales came in hotter than expected in March, rising seven tenths of a percent. And then when you take cars and gas, out of the picture of blue pass expectations rising one percent the two-year yield 4.9696 percent that's up about six basis points and the 10-year yield at 4.59 percent that's up about seven basis points companies making news trump media and technology down 15 percent the company registered its shares for potential sale now that's according to a filing and apple down half a percent its iphone shipment slid a worse than projected 10 percent in the march quarter and that was a result of sales in china that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lisa. What we try to do on surveillance is a different conversation. And Eric and the team, Eric and Bennett and the team working all weekend, really came up with an eclectic group. We began with Elliot Ackerman, his co-write with James Trevitas of 2054. Saw it in the corner of Stone the Corner Shop yeah. Bookstore in Madison yeah. Avenue this weekend. My book of the summer with Chip Wars on our technology. So what we're going to do here is different. We have a former Supreme Commander of NATO, James Stravitas, vetted at one point as a vice presidential candidate by uh, one of the sides, and Admiral Stravitas joins us this morning. Admiral, I want to talk about one thing. I want to talk about Arleigh Burke destroyers. Now, we had Spruins, one of my heroes. We had Spruance destroyers. And Elmo Zumwalt said, we got to do something fancier. And now there's Zumwalt destroyers and all that. How do Arleigh Burke destroyers defend themselves in the eastern Mediterranean from oncoming drones? Their technology is world class, isn't it? It absolutely is. And by the way, I'm thrilled to talk about it. I commanded USS Barry, an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, second in the class. I commanded a squadron, uh, eight of these destroyers in combat. I commanded Many of them. We're going to focus. I'm going to interrupt right now, folks. Right. We're focusing on this today because of all the media blather. I get it. I love it. I'm glad we're doing it at Bloomberg. This is the adult on your men and women at sea. Admiral, continue on the Arleigh Burke and the Barry. So the ships are about 500 feet long, 66 feet wide. But here's the punchline, Tom. Uh, they carry about 95 anti-air and land attack missiles. They have an unmatched capability to defend themselves. 
350 sailors aboard, two helicopters on most of the ships in the class, and they've been used most recently over the last 48 hours in the Red Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean, knocking down the uh, Iranian air attack and doing so quite effectively. Right. What's important here, and you know, folks, we got an idea of a 19-year-old on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Yep. I think it's something we all understand yep. from Vietnam forward. Max Hastings grabs that beautifully in his book on Vietnam. Admiral Stavridis, do you have like a 19-year-old kid handling a Philance close-in weapon system, CIWS, for point defense against drones from Iran? Absolutely. Um, there'll be somebody, maybe 20, 25 at the oh. most, sitting in the combat information center with his or her finger on the button for that uh, Whiz system, as we call it. It's a Gatling gun that fires uranium projectiles. Um, if any of the missiles get through the air defenses, right. the longer range ones, we use those close in. But the whole ship is manned by very young people. When I was captain of the ship, I was 37 years old. Wow. It, the, the, this, folks, is just so yep. important. And I got to get one more question here because Paul's looking at me like, when do I get to talk? <laughs> and and Amherst Davidis, just where are we in our Navy development? We've got this whole thing that we've stopped there, shipbuilding. But I don't mean the Gerald Ford and a ginormous platform. How many more Berries and Burks do we develop? We're going to be bringing out a new class, uh, USS Constellation class, frigate that's almost as big as these guided missile destroyers. First one is uh, uh, having her keel laid this week, as a matter of fact. So the follow-on classes, frankly, will be even better than these early Burks, and they're pretty damn good. <laughs> Admiral, it's been a busy week in that part of the world over there with the uh, Iranian uh, response and, and shelling of Israel. Put it into context of how at risk are our ships and our men and women in that part of the world? And how do we protect them better, perhaps? Um, our sailors are uh, on board the unmatched, most capable warships in the world. They can absolutely defend themselves in any scenario. But um, there's always a possibility of a missile slipping through, of a, a mistake being made in a radar, uh, bad intelligence as you're looking in the opposite direction. Uh, these kind of incidents can happen. So thus far, None of our ships, our warships, have been struck by Iranian or Houthi ballistic missiles or drones, but um, the sailors there absolutely have to stay on their toes to execute their mission, not only defending themselves, but defending our allies in the region like Israel. Admiral, what do you expect from Israel over the coming days and weeks here? Um, it's, it just feels like we've kind of gotten into this stalemate type of situation in that part of the world? The Israelis have said they will respond to this 350 drone ballistic missile, cruise missile attack. Fortunately, the air defenses we're discussing uh -huh. uh, destroyed it, knocked down 350 of them, essentially. Uh, but Israel will respond. However, Paul, I don't think it'll be a massive uh, jets whistling above Tehran kind of response. I think it'll right. include offensive cyber, maritime operations, special operations. Don't look for a big escalation at this point. One more question there, but we're only doing this because we want you to come back on the show. I noticed that the <laughs> USS Barry was named two years ago the Navy's top Pacific Fleet sub hunter. Bring that over to the Hormuz Strait. How much risk do we have of Iran without our technology like the USS Barry shutting down the Hormuz Strait? Iran could shut it down, Tom, with mines, putting mines in the water. That's why our mine sweepers are stationed over there. Our allies have mine sweeping capability. And then finally, the Iranians also have diesel submarines, quite quiet, wow. quite capable. But a ship like USS Barry should be able to handle that threat as well. Watch the mine sweeping. That would be the way they would close the strait. Admiral, thank you so much uh, this morning. Uh, Admiral Estravides, of course, I can't say enough about 2034 and yeah. just out moving on to the technology that we can't imagine. Elliot Ackerman and James Stravides, 2054. Yep. It is my book of uh, the summer. Where are you, Paul? I'm lost. I got features of 42. I'm looking at pictures of the USS Barry. I don't think I want to be on the 
you know, the other side of that one. That looks amazing, I mean, in terms of the performance there. So, um, so very good for the Admiral. I'm looking at futures here up uh, eight tenths of 1% on the S&P 500, uh, the NASDAQ up eight tenths of 1% as well. With our news in New York City, here's Mr. John Tucker. All right, thanks, Paul. Well, former President Donald Trump has arrived at New York court for his criminal trial, and Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines is covering the trial for us. Donald Trump's historic New York criminal trial begins today, the first ever for a former U.S. president. He's charged by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, allegedly concealing hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Trump will be legally required to attend as a criminal defendant despite his ongoing presidential campaign. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. The proceedings today begin with jury selection, which could last up to two weeks. The trial in total could last up to eight. In New York, Kaylee Lines, Bloomberg. Radio. And Kaylee will be with us for a live report at the bottom of the hour. The White House National Security Advisor John Kirby says it was an allied effort that managed to mostly foil an unprecedented attack by Iran on Israel over the weekend. Ballistic missile destroyers uh, in the Eastern Med helping shoot down ballistic missiles, uh, fighter aircraft in the air, uh, other partners participating. There was a lot of tools in the toolbox and that was that there's no question that Iran recognizes uh, uh, the coalition that was put together uh, to help uh, to help Israel defend itself. Kirby speaking on Bloomberg TV and radio. The White House and European officials urged Israel to show restraint as they try to prevent a direct conflict with Iran which could hit the global economy and send oil and gas prices much higher. President Biden is especially keen to avoid that in this election year. House Speaker Mike Johnson promising a vote on aid to Israel this week, and he's indicating funds for Ukraine could be part of the package. The House Foreign Affairs Chair Michael McCall tells CBS's Face of the Nation Ukraine needs to be included. What I need to educate my colleagues is they're all tied together. I mean, Iran is selling this stuff to Russia. Guess who's buying Iran's energy? China. And you know why? Because we, we lifted or waived the sanctions that we had, this administration, on the drones and, and the missiles and on the energy. Well, you can hear Face the Nation and Meet the Press and this week every Sunday on Bloomberg Radio. And the FBI conducting a criminal investigation into the deadly collapse of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge is focused on the circumstances leading up to it and whether all federal laws were followed. In the meantime, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott also announced this morning a partnership with two law firms to launch legal action to hold the wrongdoers responsible and mitigate harm to city residents. We have global news 24 hours a day and whatever you want it. We have Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, uh, John Paul, Tucker, thank Lisa. you so much. Uh, Paul Sweeney, uh, DJT, is the different networks are showing uh, the process towards a criminal trial uh, in New York. Yep. There's a securities filing, an S-1, on DJT driving to stop 23, 30, 32, I should say, 32 down to 27. Yeah, it's amazing. So they filed a, an S-1 here, um, filed a sell shares, including those held by insiders and linked to warrants. The move is a first step toward opening the door for Trump and other insiders to get approval from the company's board to begin capitalizing on their stake. As many as 146 million common shares registered, as yeah. well as 21 million shares well, that are issued upon the exercise of warrants. So stock down uh, now about 15% of pre-market trading, I'm, Tom, it's been I'm, under. I'm doing quick, uh, oh, he's got the S quick the HP 12C math here. Boom. And I got 78% of 148 million shares being sold by the former president. That from uh, the registration. From New York, Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lise Mateo. Futures pointing to a higher open. We've had so much in the air. We've had ge geopolitical tension. Earnings season continues. We've already heard from Goldman Sachs. Those shares up more than 4%. Charles Schwab down more than 1%. M&T Bank down about half a percent. So we have NASDAQ futures up 9 tenths of a percent. Dow futures, S&P futures up 8 tenths of a percent. Uh, we also learned retail sales rose more than expected last month after an upward revision to February's number. New York Fed President John William says he still expects the economy to grow just a little bit more slowly. The two-year yield at 4.97%, that's up seven basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.60%, and that's up about eight basis points. We'll head over to Salesforce. They're down nearly 3%. The company targeting Informatica to hold its to boost its cap, uh, data capability. That would be its biggest ever deal. Then we have Tesla down half a percent. It's cutting over 10% of its workforce after a slowdown in demand. Elon Musk prepares a company for that next phase of growth. And Ford taking aim at Tesla. It's offering Tesla owners a special discount on its F-150 Lightning and Mustang Mach-E. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Thank you so much. The Tesla thing, I, I don't know what to make of it. I don't I, I've always yep. felt clueless on this. Like, I don't believe it's a tech company. I believe it's a car company. Right. I could well be wrong on that, folks. Don't, get, don't send me hate mail out on live <laughs> chat. On YouTube, but what do you what do you think? Paul? I saw a lot of them on the street this weekend. Oh yeah, that's I mean, a fact. Oh uh, yeah, they're all out there. I mean, they're great, great vehicles. The people who love them. How about Mr. Matt Winkler for one, the founder of Bloomberg News? He loves his Tesla, as do I think most uh, owners. Um, but the problem for investors right now is trying to get a gauge on where ultimate demand is, not just for Teslas, but for electric vehicles in general. So um, that's kind of the issue, I think, right now. And investors just just don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, so we've it's seen the be... U.S. auto manufacturers, Ford and GM, and the others pull back on their um, growth initiatives on the EV space, and so the, it's just calling the question in general again what the demand is out there for EVs. Well, we'll see on Tesla uh, is the stocks is, down thirty well, percent year to date, thirty one percent year to yeah, date. Now, to yeah, yeah, look at the bonds. I guess they're holding up. I, I don't know. The, right now, pre market here, we got futures up forty four, a Dow up three thirty one. Uh, the VIX was a 17 level, and we come into 16.35, and we're almost in almost a stick there. It's a very constructive market. And Paul, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we got to go to where, yep. I mean, I was like you. I really wasn't focused on this this weekend with great coverage by Ethan Bronner out of Tel Aviv and our team. But Brent crude, global oil, was yep. a 90, 91 for a cup of tea, it was a, a cup of tea is a pharaoh thing. Cup yep. of coffee, it was ninety two dollars eighty nine seventy six from ninety two. Here we are. That's, I mean, we're yeah. stuck. I mean, oil Brent crude is up over twenty percent year to date, which kind of goes to um, right. the supply concerns out there. This was, I, I would say, a, a demand driven oil market up until you know October seventh, and then it kind of came into question. All right, let's take a look at the supply side of global oil. Are we going to have are we going to have some, some supply challenges uh, coming out of the Middle East? And that's the premium that seems to be built in over the last uh, six months here in crude oil. So again, yeah. Brent crude ate just under ninety dollars per barrel. In the streaming area, and I, I guess there's no update on Paramount today, folks. The soap <laughs> opera continues this week, and I tried to be a doobie and read about it so I could say something intelligent to Paul. But you know, and I know Disney's got its own body language, but just as a proxy, Warner Brothers Discovery and oh, Lucas boy. Shaw in his note this morning basically said, nobody's really sure where Hollywood is in five years. No. He went carefully through the movies. Lisa, when's the last time you went to the movies? Uh, probably about two weeks ago. Oh, yeah. really? Good. That's yeah, really yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, No, and I bring the whole family, get the popcorn. Spend a lot of money. And yeah, <laughs> take exactly. Back. I'm how much yeah. is the thing of popcorn? Like you don't get the embarrassing oh. one. Oh, we get the big one. You but get the see, big we one? all split it. Ah. Okay. So whoever Across sits the in the middle holds the popcorn, and okay. then everyone else just reaches in. And how much <laughs> is how much is a ginormous popcorn? Oh my gosh! I think now it's about ten bucks. Ten, twelve bucks there you go. for popcorn. Yeah. Do you Short know meter. how cheap popcorn is? Exactly. I don't know. I'm so, looking at you know, oh. and I know each store. It's like the banks. Each store is different. But Paul, I don't know what a long-only mutual fund does. It's supposed to have balanced sector investment, yeah. or frankly, a passive index fund. The chart on Warner Brothers Discovery no. 
just says something's going to break here going from 12 down to 8. I was uh, down at Duke last week and uh, at a board meeting and I was sitting next to one of the biggest hedge fund managers who traffics in TMT stocks and he and does not own one media stock. First time in his 30 year career he doesn't own How one How do you media respond stock. to that? I mean you've lived this for 4 he's, years. I mean he's you've drunk the Kool-Aid for 40 exactly. years. Exactly. And this investor who is way smarter than me and knows a lot more than I do and all the people in Hollywood says it's just uninvestable. I don't know where it's going. And, you know, I just can't put capital uh, to, at risk in a business where I don't know I look, where the business is going. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier, folks. I looked at three-body problem this weekend. It's the betting off Game of Thrones people. <laughs> and it's, like, exciting. I mean, they're doing this thing, and it's huge. I can't imagine what it costs. I have no idea if it's a good series. you got to watch the second episode. But the, the basic idea is the model's broken. And over the weekend, in the huge news flow, folks, Netflix says, we're going to pay attention to the audience. Yep. Does that mean the chess one? Remember oh, that's Netflix a good one. Did yeah, the chess one. one? Yeah, the chess one, yeah. The, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Yep. The, the, the Queen's whatever. Queen's Gambit. The there Queen's Gambit. There I nailed go. it. Yep. Uh, but, or Shogun. I, I mean, are they done? Um, no, they're not done. But I think they're going, I think what's done is the ability to just walk into Netflix's okay. offices in Hollywood and they will throw a gob of money at you to create something. What we're going to do here, we've got some guest challenges here. We're going to give you a summary of what Paul Sweeney and I see uh, this morning. And the summary is a team that put together terrific expertise on the military events over the weekend. And Paul, I'll just mention, starting at the beginning, Elliot Ackerman, Yep. making uh, very clear this is a new technology and the drones set up a new warfare. Yeah, it is. It's So we saw, you know, I, when did, I think this kind of feels like the first time I've ever heard a, an attack on a target be it, like Israel become, you know, primarily drone driven. That's not something we've typically dealt with in the past. It's usually been some type of missile attack. So we had some combination of, of the two right. over, over the weekend. And I guess the good, obviously the good news for the folks in Israel is that their defenses uh, took out the vast, vast uh, majority, if not uh, nearly all of those uh, attacking drones and missiles. So now the question as we wake up here on a, on a Monday morning on Wall Street is what's the response from Israel? And part of it is the funding of Israel, which I believe Greg Villiers note this morning is this will certainly spur forward funding, but in the details of our discussion with James Stravitas about ships he's commanded, yes. these Arleigh Burke, I'm going to call them a destroyer, yep. guided cruiser, whatever they are, the bill for us in this war that we're not in, we keep saying we're not in this war. Oh, really? Yeah. And I, I just wonder how the funding uh, will go and, of course, into an election season as well. Balance of power, I'm sure, will do a lot on that. Yeah, and no, it's always well. great speaking with Admiral Stravitas because he obviously has the best uh, contacts and the best uh, experience to draw upon as it relates to these geopolitical political issues. And obviously, during his career, he served all over the world. And right. again, when you talk to a, an admiral who was <clears throat> commanding men and women at sea and kind of what they're thinking, what they're dealing with, right. uh, it really hits home. I, I got a 15% dilution this morning on DJT. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, you do a secondary offering like this, and I mean, usually there's a road show. Can you imagine, like, the conference call or the Zoom meeting I or don't. lunch? I guess yeah. you have it at a Trump property. <laughs> I you know. Guess. The but lunch I'll, with a merch? But all I see is on our screens here is, uh, you know, the TV networks covering Mr. Trump uh, supposedly arriving at a courthouse in lower Manhattan. So I don't know how you how coordinate you the, both? the, you know, the court uh, hearings along with the roadshow situation. But again, that stock uh, down about 12 percent here in pre-market trading. Uh, and it's traded down pretty substantially once the financial data for their results for uh, calendar year 23 <clears throat> came out, which showed a $58 right. million dollar net well. income loss on only $4 million of revenue, and that's put a tremendous pressure on this. Thank stock. you for the huge response. A Monday morning data check. We're going to continue on to another strong half hour, uh, finishing really wonderfully up in Boston with their Patriots Day and the Red Sox, uh, Cleveland Guardians. I keep saying Indians, and I'm told that's a Lisa, Lisa chastised. Is he? Okay. They're the Guardians, yeah, which I, I think has something to yep. do with Cleveland. You know, yep. it's like the name works. And uh, they'll have a spirit at 11.10 a.m. baseball a game today. Futures up 42, Dow Futures 332. The VIX really comes in nice, an improvement of a stick, 17.3 to 16.3. Dollar, the DXY over 106, wow. Dollar resiliency, the two-year yield 4.97%. 
Stay with us on Apple CarPlay on YouTube. Good morning. and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. In the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney with your opening bell report. Now, a lot has happened before the bell. Earnings season continued. We had more banks opening their books. We'll get to that in just a bit. Retail sales also came in hotter than expected in March, rising seven-tenths of a percent. We've also had geopolitical tension in the Middle East after Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend. So how will stocks kick off the week? Will it be a positive note? Let's get to it as things start to turn up. Right now, the S&P 500 up seven-tenths of a percent. The Dow up nearly a percent right now, nine-tenths of a percent. And the Nasdaq up six-tenths of a percent. The two-year yield at 4.97 percent. That's up about seven basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.61 percent. And that's up about nine basis points. To commodities right now, we have Spot gold higher at 2,354 an ounce. NYMEX crude, $85 a barrel. Brent crude, $89 a barrel. At the open, we want to talk about Goldman Sachs right now. They are up 5%. We have Charles Schwab. They're up 1%. And finally, m and Bank. They're down about half a percent. That is your Bloomberg opening bell report. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thank you uh, so much. What we're going to do now, 
We're going to speak on the uh, efforts in the Eastern Mediterranean. Mick Mulroy is going to join us in a bit. Right now, we're going to go to Kaylee Lines, who is on Center Street in front of the criminal court. We're doing this. We're, we're getting the feed in right now for the former president speaking, but I want to go to Kaylee Lines first. Kaylee, the emotion and the tension of this criminal court it's different than other court appearances, isn't it? It is, Tom, because this is a historic moment we're talking about here. This is the first time in U.S. history that a former president is on criminal trial. Yes, Trump has used court appearances in the past to galvanize supporters to campaign realistically for free. And yet this is very different because at the end of this process, which could last six to eight weeks, he could be a convicted felon. What he's charged with here is 34 felony counts of falsifying business records related to hush money payments paid to porn star Stormy Daniels in, in the days just before the 2016 election. And each of those counts could carry a maximum sentence of four years in prison if he is convicted. Now, of course, we're a long way from actually getting a verdict from this uh, jury that is being selected today. But still, this is a really historic moment. Jury selection is what will start today. That's a process that could last one to two weeks right. as they try to weed out jurors that can be impartial and fair in assessing not just a former president, but a right. current Republican presumptive nominee. Kaylee, we've all been, Paul, have you done, have you ever been selected for a jury? No, I have not. I have never been. They look no. at me, Kaylee, and they start laughing. <laughs> this is serious stuff. Is this jury selection process different than a normal process? It's going to be quite extensive, Tom. In some sense, this will be like a normal jury selection. There will be a questionnaire for potential jurors, but the pool could be uh, significantly larger as they have to try to weed out individuals that could potentially have tainted views of Donald Trump as a defendant. We understand that this questionnaire will ask questions like, do you have a true social account? Have you ever attended a Trump rally? Are you affiliated with groups like Antifa or QAnon? That's the kind of questions that they uh, right. will have to have answers to in order to get this 12 and, person jury and six alternates. And Paul, one of the questions has to be, do you listen to Bloomberg surveillance? Oh, of course. I mean, clearly. <laughs> exactly. So Kaylee, <laughs> do we expect former President Trump to be at the courthouse every day of this trial? As a criminal defendant, Paul, he is required to. He okay. is here this morning, uh, should be just entering the courthouse now as we speak, and he will be here every weekday aside from Wednesdays for the duration of this trial, which of course he says is part of what all of this is about. He views this as a weaponized Justice Department against him, intended to keep him off the campaign trail. But again, he tends to use these court appearances as a way to campaign, to come out and talk to press and plead his case. But certainly this is going to right. prevent him from traveling to other states that typically a presidential candidate uh, would be able to. And of course, there's a lot of financial outlay he is uh, dealing with here as well as he has to pay right. his defense attorneys. And that could be millions of dollars. Katie Lines in front of the yeah. Center Street Courthouse. This is the old Tombs prison from the 19th century, and then another building, 1890-ish. It's great. The, the New York the New York courthouse is one building, and literally across the street yeah. is, the, is the federal courthouse. But they're different you don't buildings. Be, yes, this and you is don't be criminal court. Those. New York yep. City criminal court. It's not the same court that we're used to going down there for any other affairs uh, that we have. A quick market check before we look to the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, a nice lift to the market, up 350 points in the Dow. Seven-tenths of a move on Standard & Poor's 500. Dow leads the way up uh, 1%. The VIX, 16.52. Uh, what we tried to do over the weekend, and thank you to Eric and Bennett for their huge support of just blowing up the show three and four times, is get different perspective. Mick Mulroy is a former U.S. Department Assistant Secretary of Defense focused on the Middle East. And we're honored that we will finish our coverage today uh, with him. Thank you to Admiral Stravitas, Elliot Ackerman, and other worthies, Ian Bremer, for their perspective. Uh, Mick, thank you so much for, for joining. I guess we have to fund this. We're not at war, but it sure feels like we're at war. Does the Pentagon this morning feel like it's at war? It's great to be with you guys, as always. Uh, I think the Pentagon thinks that a lot of our closest allies, partners are at war. So that in, in many senses uh, makes us on a war footing, especially when it comes to logistics and intelligence support uh, in a wartime environment. So we personally, I mean, we are not at war, but that is something we're trying to avoid right now. 
And uh, right. a lot of uh, decisions coming up are going to determine whether that's what the case. Would you, what would you say to senators and Congress people this morning about the future funding of this? Not only the defense of 500 people on an early Burke cruise missile, but also the Americans spread out across this troubled zone. How do we fund this? So with all the funding bills right now that, that are being reviewed in the House, I would say that all of them, both uh, Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, are directly in our own national security interests. So it's not charity. It's not a giveaway. It is essentially uh, part of being the leader of the free world that supports these key democracies who are potentially either engaged in a war like Ukraine and now Israel, or potentially going to be uh, engaged uh, like Taiwan and China. So I think there's two parts of it. Of course, as you mentioned, we have we have a lot of uh, military positions throughout the Middle East. We need to shore them up and make sure that they're secure. They are likely going to be targets, and we already know they have been. Quite frankly. Uh, way before the war in Gaza even started. So we have to secure, secure them, but we also have to provide our key partners and allies with the what they need to fight these battles uh, in, the, in the immediate term and also potentially in the long term. Because with Taiwan, if they're such a hard target, the war might not start. And so there's two parts to that. Hey, Mick, I'd love to get a sense of from, from your the folks you talk to on the ground over the mid Middle East, what do you think Israel's end game is at this point? How do they view it? So Israel certainly has a very advanced uh, modern military, very impressed with what they can do. Uh, you talk to senior IDF folks, they generally don't have long-term strategic uh, discussions, and they'll tell you that straight up. Mm. Uh, they, they feel like they have to deal with um, you know, the closest alligator to the boat every day, so to speak. But I do think right now what they're looking at does have some strategic impact. So they have attacked and killed IRGC Quds Force officers, the primary Iranian entity that deals with proxies that attack Israel every day, and us for that matter. So now because they have struck them, Iran feels compelled that they can then launch 300 uh, cruise missiles, uh, ballistic missiles, and drones at Israel, which if it wasn't for the actions of Israel, the U.S., the U.K., and some Arab countries would have caused devastation. So if they don't react by striking in Iran, they're going to let this new paradigm stand, so to speak. So that could have very strong strategic impacts. And I think that is what Israel is looking at right now when it comes to determination of whether they do strike back in Iran. I think that's quite possible. But if they do, how significant? Are they going to try to take out nuclear facilities? Or are they going to try to take out some symbolic, you know, uh, Shahid drone uh, manufacturing yeah. facility? Something something to that magnitude. Right. Mick, what, how do you think Iran wants to proceed from here? Do they have any desire for a direct confrontation against Israel, much less the United States? I don't think so. I, this is not, uh, Iran likes to fight through their proxies. We've seen that primarily through their history. They're not very good at winning wars and they don't like to get in them. Uh, and they know, uh, you know, quite frankly, that Israel has much more capabilities than they do. So I think that's one of the reasons why before they even launched all of the projectiles toward Israel, they were already messaging in the UN that they considered this matter over. Uh, and, of course, they declared victory, even though 99% yeah. of them were shot down. Most of them didn't even get much past Iraq, to be frank. Uh, but I think they don't want to see a confrontation, and nobody really should, right? This, is, this isn't this is a movie. This is real. This would have major impacts on all of the countries, the Middle East, and quite frankly, the, yeah. the global markets. And I don't need to tell you all that. That's right. But this is something that we should try to avoid. Right where I wanted to go. This isn't a movie. We have run out of time. Mick Mulroy, thank you so much. Lobo Institute yep. uh, with us. He's a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. The Dow up 364 points. With our news in New York City, John Tucker. All right, Tom, Donald Trump has arrived at the New York courthouse where his first criminal trial is set to get underway this morning. The former president taken to the building in Lower Manhattan from Trump Tower amid tight security as news helicopters circled to the area. Uh, the building was thronged by journalists from around the world and members of the public. The trial set to start with jury selection. That could last at least two weeks. 
Iran's attack on Israel sparks a race to avert a full-blown war. U.S. officials and allies focusing now on efforts to ensure any retaliation from Israel doesn't raise the stakes too high. Let's get more from Israeli Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner in Tel Aviv. The hardliners here who are demanding uh, gratification uh, for uh, to go after Iran, they will be answered by being told that, well, Israel is not going to do that, but it's going to redouble its efforts in Gaza. Now, of course, by doing that, and there's this question of going into Rafah, uh, they could alienate the United States again. But I'm guessing that they'll be able to cut a deal with the U.S., but we shall see. Almost all the more than 300 drones and missiles fired against Israel were intercepted. And that underscores an air defense system that's one of the strategic pillars of the U.S.-Israeli alliance. Let's get more on that end of the story from Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger. Israel's most active and well-known air defense is Iron Dome. It sits alongside other missile defense systems like the Arrow to counter ballistic missiles and David Sling for medium-range rocket or missile attacks. Israel initially developed the Iron Dome alone after the 2006 Lebanon War and was later joined by the United States, which has provided know-how and billions in bipartisan financial support for the program. Virginia-based Raytheon helps to manufacture manufacture the Iron Dome. Jeff Bullinger, Bloomberg Radio. And the Washington Post reporting the FBI has opened a criminal investigation focusing on the massive container ship that brought down the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore last month. It's a probe that will look at, at least in part, at whether the crew left the port knowing the vessel had serious systems problems. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Tom Paul. I mean, Lisa. news negative, Tesla down, Donald J. Trump down, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Let's talk about something positive. Yeah. I'm sorry, Goldman Sachs off the gloom of December. Yep. Moonshot, Sri Natarajan doing a great uh, effort for Bloomberg News on this. Paul up 5 6%, not bad. I mean, if I'm a Goldman, having competed against Goldman Sachs for 30 years, I know how good they are. If I were an investor, I would say, just stick to your business, generate superior returns vis-a-vis -vis your competitors, which they do almost by definition, if you look over the past 20, 30 years. And that's it, that's enough. I don't need you going into huge new lines of business like consumer mm -hmm. banking. I think with their capital markets and their advisory business and whatever type of capital they wanna put at risk on their balance sheet, mm -hmm. um, to me, that would be a great return story. Max Abelson, I don't know if he's work from home or work from office with Max, you never know. He just brings it though. Max Abelson, Hannah Levitt, they're out on top live uh, with Goldman Sachs and, and Mr. Solomon waxing philosophical about uh, the strategic focus, we feel very good about our first quarter results, yeah. I'll say, up five, six percent at Goldman Sachs. The VIX 16.39, halfway back to a relative calm here. We need to say again, thank you to Eric and Bennett for just blowing up the show this weekend.
day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Stocks kicking off the week on a positive note. New data showed economic resilience. We also had more banks opening their books. We have Goldman Sachs down up about 5%. We have Charles Schwab up 4% and M&T Bank up about 7%. Over to the two-year yield at 4.98%. That's up about eight basis points. A 10-year yield at 4.63%. And that's up about one base, uh, 10 basis points. Over to currencies, we have the dollar weaker, Japanese yen weaker, euro weaker, British pound stronger. We have Bitcoin up 3% at 66,302. Moving the markets, Trump Media and Technology. Right now, DJT down 12%. The company registered its shares for potential resale. Then we have Apple down nearly 1%. Its iPhone shipments slid a worse than expected, 10% uh, in the March quarter. That was due to sales in China. And finally, Tesla, they're down 3%, cutting over 10% of its workforce. And we're also learning its senior VP, Drew Baglino, is reportedly leaving the company. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much. I greately, greatly appreciate it, Lisa Mateo. Uh, a special day in Boston. There's the Boston Marathon, the magic of the Red Sox, Cleveland Guardians. 11, 10 a.m., there's just something absolutely, it's like, okay, this is our own holiday in Boston. And to all of you around the world, what you need to know is this is all built off heritage. Now, Paul, as you well know, the worst trade in the history of the Red Sox was giving up the Mookster to the Los Angeles Dodgers. <laughs> no. The best trade ever in the history of the Boston Red Sox is we unloaded Heathcliff Slocum to the Seattle Mariners <laughs> for a catcher named Jer Jason Veritek and some pitcher they were packaging in named uh, Mr. Lowe. Derek Lowe joins us now. Derek, what was it like the day you and Veritek were traded to the Red Sox? How'd you feel about that? Um, back in, uh, what was it, 97. Um, a lot of people wanted Jason Veritek. We were both together in AAA in Tacoma, Washington. And, you know, there yeah. were some, some rumblings about me getting traded. And so, yeah, it was it was a funny thing. They, uh, you know, we obviously both got traded. I had Dan right. I've told the story many a time. Thought Jason was an overweight catcher, and he thought I was <laughs> left-handed. So it was, it was, a, it was a, a great time. Um, I didn't know a lot about Boston at the time. Didn't know the history. Yeah. Um, so it was just a, a great place right. to play for eight years for her. Just because of time here and with the support, of course, the Red Sox with the Jimmy Fun, um, we need to talk about your cancer and what you're doing to help medical people advance our cancer research. Tell us about the skin cancer you've had and how you're trying to help our medical system. Yeah, I've had I had squamous cell carcinoma about geez, old Pete's twenty five six years ago. Um, you know, as far as what to do, you know, you just try to talk to kids early prevention. As far as you know, put your sunscreen on. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of adults now to make sure that you know I live in Florida, so you're in the sun all the time. Make sure you get yeah. your checkups. You know, even if you're feeling good, you don't see any lumps or bumps. Make sure you get in there. But uh, yeah, it was a scary moment. There's no doubt about right. it. You wake up and you hear the C word in your work, in, in your life. It's, that's not the greatest thing you want to hear. But, um, you know, they're able to do a great job uh, to get it out. Right. And, and again, so far, so good. I haven't had any other relapses so right. far. Ken Rosenthal, I think, has really led on this at the athletic fo uh, folks and everyone's really picked up on it. And this is important for Derek uh, Lowe. They don't pitch now, Derek, like you guys pitch. There's a new level of spin in need to pitch 96 miles an hour. People like mm -hmm. you are breaking down. What does baseball yep. do about the young Derek Lowe's injured? That's a great question. Um, I know I don't get drafted. I know that. You know, I think it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're we're at a we're at a very interesting point in our game. You know, it, it's velocity, 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 and, and you know, and it's, you know, and, and, and that's what kids they know that yep. too. They know they don't have to as a starting pitcher. They're not asked to go throw six, seven, eight innings, kind of like what they used to before. It's just you go out and go as hard as you possibly can. Um, Probably knowing at some point you're going to have a Tommy John surgery. You look at the rate of Tommy John surgeries; it's through the roof. Yep. Um, but you know what? I, I don't. You know, as an older player, I sit back and I go to spring training and I listen and and I have my opinions. But 
you know, my my opinion is just it is what it is. You know, this is this is the game. They're teaching these kids, even every younger level, just to throw as hard as you possibly can. So, you know, I I enjoyed my time. I enjoyed the way I pitched. I, I believe, you know, being an 88 to 90 mile an hour velocity guy, you weren't overpowering anybody. So you had to yep. use your smarts. Yeah. And uh, I enjoy pitching like that. Hey, Derek, what do you think about the pitch clock? A lot of fans seem to like it here, speeding up the game. What do you think? I like it. You know, you know, as as an ex-athlete, you know, it, it was painful to watch a three-hour and ten-minute two-to-one <laughs> game. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think they did a good job last year. I think it was 24, 25 minutes, whatever they knocked off. Um, anything to speed up the game yeah. because, you know, the pitchers are – are dominating as far as strikeouts and there's a lot less action and, and so you're going to have to find a way to keep the keep the you know right. the fan and the kids interested too because you're, you're going to need the next generation of fans at some point and this credible days of news with this derek lowe for me always a red sox player he pitched two cups of coffee for the yankees is not going into the <laughs> hall of fame in a yankees <laughs> uniform there's a great anecdote derek lowe about you sitting in a dugout in a hyperkinetic low Paul, mm -hmm. when low pitched. And I saw this, Derek. I had four season tickets to uh, the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. You could feel the kinetic energy of low on the mound. You didn't know if it'd be good yep. or bad, right. but there was a kinetic <laughs> energy. And one of the great calming influences, Derek Lowe, for you was the giant of the Braves, Greg Maddox. You sat yep. in a dugout with Maddox, and he made you better. What did Greg Maddox say to yep. you to calm you down? Well, <laughs> um, first of all, he well, I played with him twice in L.A. both times. And in both times, I, I don't believe I lost a game in the month of September. What he saw, we'd sit down and watch videos. And it's hard to explain, you know, over the phone. But what he what he saw in the videos is stuff that I, I, I did not see. You know, was, this was towards the end of my career. And I, I was pretty successful at this point. But he just he saw things. He watched guys' feet. He watched guys' hands. He watched where foul balls went, you know, and stuff that I, I never triggered in my brain at any point. You know, yes, I watched video, and I could see the generic things that most of us could, but he was, he could see the most unique things. And um, he'd call pitches for me during the game sometimes. I'd look over. He'd kind of give me a direction one way or another. Um, but just I, I think not just Greg, but – uh, you know, very successful people in a, an elite, elite Hall of Fame athletes are different. You know, if you sit yeah. down with a Tom Brady and if you sit down with somebody else, a Mac Jones, they're probably not going to see the same thing. And I'm not picking on yeah. Mac. It's just that there's just a different level of um, understanding. Yeah. And, and they just see they just see the game different. It's the bottom line. Derek Lowe, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Always for me with the Red Sox on this uh, Patriots Day. I want to digress. We got to get some Yankees time in here. Jason Kelly <laughs> with a guy named A Rod yeah. out uh, doing the deal here for Bloomberg. Derek Lowe there of the Red Sox. We got to get back to these markets. Dow up 300 points, up nine tenths of a percent. The VIX now in a full stick, 16.30. The two-year yield 4.98%. I'm sorry, look at the 10-year real yield, Paul. This is a different market now going into the heart of earnings season. It is. It's one that's kind of baking in, you know, higher rates for longer. And as Tom, you're on the 5% watch on that two-year, 4.97%. Even on your on your 10-year, up 10 basis points today, 4.62%. Remember talking with Ira Jersey from Bloomberg Intelligence who covers all the rates. He was just calling out some technicals on the 10-year. On the and he says, hey, if you get below... Above 4.51%, 4.7% is your next resistance level. Well, and we're pushing higher towards that right here. So <clears> rates <throat> higher, uh, yet we've got stocks rebounding off that Friday sell-off a little bit here. Uh, the <coughs> S&P up 8 tenths of 1%. Excuse me. Uh, the 10-year yield, I'm sorry, it's not Dow 10,000, but 2.20, up 8 basis points on a 10-year real yield is just game-changing. I mean, it's just there's no, there's no other way. Uh, to put it, that's something to watch here very closely. We're going to, of course, have full coverage for you of a big earnings season. We still got Morgan Stanley. You know, we're getting ahead of her sales of the banking uh, here. But uh, needless to say, uh, it, it's going to be important. I, these guys, they call them a Celtic punk band. Really? They're just Boston. Dropkick Murphys. <laughs> Patriots Day in Boston. Next year, I'm running the marathon. Oh, yeah. <laughs>